Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Crypto Combos. I'm your host, MK Lords, and joining me today is Mr. Chris Ellis, all the way from London. You may recognize Chris as a panelist on the Bitcoin Group and also Chris Before Coffee and a few other shows on World Crypto Network. He's very active on World Crypto Network. And he's also um, uh, active with Feather, Feathercoin, too. So uh, I'm really happy to have him on. We've done some other discussions in the past. We do the Bitcoin group every week, but we've also, uh, we did an interview, it was a few months ago, uh, that was really interesting. So uh, definitely, um, excuse me. <laughs> Welcome, Chris, and uh, how are you doing today? Thanks very much for having me. It's a really delight to be here. Yeah, that show a couple of months ago was called Peace and Bitcoin. I'm still on a lifelong campaign to have that get 10,000 views because it was a really good video. I re-uploaded it, I remastered it, I put in lots of slides um, to kind of make the conversation more contextual and stuff. So uh, yeah, I got a lot of really good feedback. We had a lot of people tuning into that that were really interested in it. We got um, Andreas Antonopoulos and I think some of those themes were very important. Did you see uh, the the presentation that Stefan Molyneux did. I haven't watched it all yet. I just kind of skimmed through it. I saw it on YouTube the other day about peace and Bitcoin. So we were definitely on to something. I think we were a little bit ahead of our time, but now I'm starting to hear more voices that think that the blockchain can actually lead to an increased sense of human consciousness and self-awareness such that we don't have to act like monsters towards each other. Exactly. So I, yeah, I really enjoyed it, and it is so. I, I think it's so instrumental to peace and really, uh, you know, shaking things up. Things need to be shaken up as far as these power structures go, uh, because the power structures that we're familiar with are the ones perpetuating this violence against other people. And uh, if you're if you're supporting the currency that's funding that violence, wh whether it's the dollar or you know another state-backed currency, then there's some, you know, there's some role that you're playing in that. Uh, you've probably heard the term "holding dollars" as a political decision. Uh, so I think mm. it's the same is true with Bitcoin. There are other cryptocurrencies. I hadn't thought about it like that, but that's true. Holding dollars is definitely a political decision, even if you don't realize it yourself. And we were just talking on the Bitcoin show with Derek J um, about this very issue that the psychopath gets his or her power from the inaction of others. It's actually, it comes from apathy and that's where they draw their strength from and I don't know if you saw at Ferguson last night, I've been watching um, the events unfold because although I live in London I actually live on uh, as if I'm in the east coast of America so I stay up until about four in the morning here and I've been watching these YouTube live streams. I've been working, trying to work as a distance journalist, kind of doing a lot of fact checking. So if I see someone come out with some breaking insight or some, some news, I will then go fact check it, get a few other sources together that I think are credible, and then I will tweet it out and I'll share the links and I'll share the, the live streams with people. Um, so I was looking at that and there was a guy, there was a cop who's been, now been reprimanded and I think has been suspended from the force for, you know, threatening, you know, saying I'm going to fucking kill you to the crowd. Um, and, we were, and we were talking about the fact that, 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 that this social media movement that we've created is like a disinfectant because you're just shining a light on their behavior. And one of the things that I used to do when I was in the film industry, and I suppose I'm saying this publicly for the first time, is that I used to film a lot of these psychopaths, a lot of these small scale tyrants right because there are tyr there's tyranny everywhere there's tyranny in classrooms there's tyranny in offices uh, because the current regime that we have does a pact with them and it says look I know you'll come after me if I don't let you have your own dirty little corner over there so we'll have a deal you get to terrorize some people over there whilst I get to terrorize over everyone is that okay and they kinda go yeah okay and so people turn up to work, they listen to someone else's voice at the expense of theirs, they don't really understand the big picture, they don't know what they're contributing to, but all they know is that they're being told what to do and they get compensated with this thing called money in exchange for that irreversible currency, that undistributed kind called time. You can't redistribute time once it's gone, it's gone forever. And so I used to um, have cameras that would film, because I got so fed up with like the, the tyrannical boss that would just shout people unless you did what they wanted you to do. And there was nearly always some form of corruption going on. There were nearly always people in the office that were getting paid more than other people. And there was nearly always a bully victim. Sometimes I was the victim, sometimes it was I, I would witness it with someone else. And so I'd record it. 
And sometimes I'd tell them and sometimes I wouldn't. Um, sometimes I'd share the video out on email to other colleagues and sometimes I wouldn't. It would just depend. I've still got still got the videos. I don't know what to do with them. I might just delete them now and let by bygones be bygones. But I, I do, do encourage you, actually, that we talked about this last time, so why don't we carry on this thread, this thought. With MT Gox, what happened was you had one of these tyrants called Mark Carpellis who was committing fraud. And there were people that were witness to that, contemporaneous witnesses, that saw it unfold in real time, who for some reason chose to do nothing at the time. We don't know why yet, because we haven't spoken to them. But they were there and they saw it happening. And what I'm encouraging people to do is to take cameras in to work with them. And if their boss is a tyrant, if their boss is one of these, no, not David Brent of The Office, I mean, it's worse than that, like someone who's a real control freak, who, the test, here's the test, okay? If this person were alive in 1930s Germany, and they were German, would they be protesting against the Nazi party, or would they be one of the nice Germans driving the train? And if they're one of the nice Germans driving the train, you need to take a camera in to work with you, and you need to film them, because that's what they don't want you to do. If they knew that you were filming them, let's say it was recorded, they would be, they, I've seen it and I've got footage, some really nasty footage actually of this one guy who um, tried to defraud me of my deposit um, for some commercial um, office space. And when he realized that he'd been foiled, because he'd been lying to two, two people in order to, he'd been playing two people off of each other, I was one of them and then there was another party involved. I then contacted that party and I said, well, what has he told you? We compared notes. He didn't realize we'd been talking. So we sabotaged him, we set him up. And I went into the office, um, and then the other guy followed me in, and I was recording this. And he looks at us both going, oh, shit, you know, they're both in the same room. And so we have a meeting with him, and then I pass this chap, you know, an email that he'd been sent, both of us, and he's like, oh, fuck. And then as soon as he realized that he'd been foiled, this guy just erupted, like all psychopaths do. He just erupted. And do you know what he did? He went into victim mode, and this is a pattern I keep seeing from these psychopaths. They are justified in their actions because they feel like victims. So it's okay if I defraud someone for three and a half grand. It's okay if I lob a bunch of bombs into that territory over there. We're victims because this is part of their narrative. And he said, I'm going to sue you for this. And it's like, well, hang on, I haven't actually committed any crime. You're the one that's defrauded us. You know, we're the victims here. And as soon as he realized I was filming it, I mean, I mean, he just turned, I mean, it was just there was just something very very dark in there, um, and I you know I had a friend with me. I mean I was fine. I was surrounded by people that that were on my side, and I, by that time everyone knew what he was up to, and he ended up having to leave the whole premises. It was a good happy ending in the end. And actually, what you find is that it, you know if they think that, it, that this video camera is being streamed or if they think that enough people are party to this, they would never talk to you like that. As soon as you put a camera on these people, that darkness and that evilness just, I don't know, it turns into you know, nice, charming words a lot of the time. I'm talking if it's live. I'm talking if, it, you know, if they can't correct the record later. Then all of a sudden, they, they, they're very smooth talkers, and they, they've got a really nice tongue. And I, I think we should start encouraging people to do this more, to take direct action against them. What do you think? Absolutely. It's important to arm yourself against these sociopaths, no matter how, how petty they are. And this is something that Davi Barker has been working a lot on. I don't know if you're familiar with his authoritarian sociopathy project, but he's basically trying to see at what point someone will intervene in a case of uh, police brutality or, or, or excessive police force basically, or, or even by, by a security guard too. And some of the studies that he's used uh, that he's, he's going to be playing off of are very interesting. So you're probably familiar with the Stanford experiment, the Milgram experiment, but he kind of goes into others in his authoritarian sociopathy pamphlet. And one of them that I found was really interesting and it really raised a, uh, it kind of plays off one of your points is people who are in a position of power over others are more likely to judge others doing the same actions, the same, you know, immoral actions as them more harshly when they're in that position of power than when they're given a smaller position of power. So they did this with uh, you know, a, a group of people. They were assigned high power roles and low power roles. 
and they were, you know, basically asked to judge certain actions, you know, certain immoral actions. And yeah, sure enough, those people who are in these high power roles, they, they tended to automatically judge people more harshly and then be more lenient on themselves if they were doing the same actions. So I think that's really important when you're looking into the minds of these people. And, and something that's that Davi also brings up, and you, and you brought this up too, that you know, is it the Adolf Eichmanns of the world are more dangerous than the Adolf Hitlers of the world? Because ultimately, someone has to be following the orders. Like these cops in Ferguson, it's a, it's a really convoluted situation. I'm glad that there are, are a lot of people out there who are really sifting through the details and really trying to get to the truth of the matter because there's so much distortion and noise. And it's very hard to tell what's going on unless you're there on the ground. I do have some friends who have traveled there and they're trying to document things as much as possible. And a lot of these police, they're, they've gotten comfortable with this feeling of power. And this authority over others brings out those natural sociopathy. Sociop sorry, sociopathic tendencies. And it, it's, it's a terrible thing. The real story with Ferguson is the militarized police state. You know, it, it's, it's, I think it's less about the incident that sparked the protests and more about the response to it, which here's people resisting, uh, and you find out later that there's looting involved and things like that, but the police are targeting the journalists, the people who are trying to document everything, and they're also targeting protesters. So it's a very convoluted situation, and it really shines a light, though, on the mentality of a lot of these officers and how it's also kind of scary, too, to see the people excusing the action, you know, be, be, because of maybe some personal information about Michael Brown that's come out. I think that's even that's scarier to me. To, to me, it's, it's less scary that there are, I guess, cops out there who are willing to harm me and more scary that there are neighbors out there who would be willing to turn me in or who would be willing to maybe call, uh, you know, call the cops on me for some kind of code violation or something. That, to me, is, is much more scary. What do you think? I think right now that this, this new environment that we're ending up in, there's so much information that fortune favors the critical mind. And the, 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 there's a lot of people right now that are just tweeting, fly-by, fly by, what do you call it, a drive-by tweet, someone called it earlier on the show a fly-by tweeting where they just see something and they think it's true. Like right now on Twitter, there's a um, there's not a hashtag as such, but it's, it's if you just search for Dorian Johnson, who's the key witness to what happened uh, with the Mike Brown shooting and the officer, there's a whole contingent of people that see, look, they look like you know patriotic Americans, but they're very much pro-armed forces, they're pro-police, have just got together. There's clearly a lot going on on the back channels to try and promote this new narrative which is that Dorian Johnson has changed his story, that now apparently we're being told um, just by, you know, basically all we've got at the moment is a, a Facebook post and a bunch of Twitters, you know, people tweeting about it. I've got no credible source yet that he has changed his story and that in fact there was a scuffle for the gun uh, that Mike was involved in and therefore implying that uh, Mike deserved to be shot, that this was justifiable homicide. So I don't know if this is true. I'm not backing, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm on the side of truth, right? I don't pick teams, I pick truth. And at the moment, I'm pretty much broadly in support of the majority of people on the Ferguson hashtag, which is that these protests are perfectly justified, should be encouraged, and if the police continue to act like this, we should take more action in supporting their resistance. Because if you, 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 if you stand up to someone's existence, expect resistance, right? That's the saying. And if you just like pen someone in, you treat them like shit for years and years and years, you know, riot is the language of the unheard, as Dr. King said, and people will act out. And what tends to happen, what you find in these localities is that most of the influencing factors in a locality come from the externality. They come from things that you wouldn't even consider. In the old days, it was the weather. That was what impacted your locality. And if you look at a lot of ancient texts, particularly if you look at the, the I Ching and uh, Confucius in, in China, they always talked about you know, the weather, right? Because this was this big, unpredictable thing that would come outside of your sphere of influence. But now all kinds of things come at you from outside of your sphere of influence because we occupy more territory across the globe. So actually, in fact, in the summer in London, we had 
these sandstorms, well, not sandstorms, but sand was falling out of the sky, right? And you had sand all over the cars, and it was it came from the Sahara Desert because the earth is alive, it's a living organism and what happens is that the sand gets blown up into the atmosphere, it gets deposited in other parts of the world, particularly the rainforests of South America and then that sand churns up the soil in the milder climates which then give rise to all kinds of life forms. So the earth is a, is a closed loop system, I keep trying to tell people this and you can't, you don't exist outside of a context. What's different now is that we have the big picture. We can see across these geospatial boundaries in real time like we never have before. And some people have better filters than other others do. Some people are on the social media channels who aren't taking bullshit and every time there's some breaking news they will go away and fact check it and you can follow Andy Carvin of NPR. I encourage everyone to follow in his lead, um, read his work and become a distance journalist yourself, I encourage us to do that on the World Crypto Network too, that we should be really laying the framework of like how this should be done, so that then people know that they've got a good reliable news source to go to, but not like mainstream media where they've got a particular agenda that they want to push because they're paymasters, because we don't have any paymasters here on this channel, right? People donate to us because they like the quality of the show. When you're, when you're getting hundreds and hundreds of dollar donations from people, it's hard for anyone to control your message now, right? Because it's such a distributed financing model. You haven't got one person pushing a particular agenda anymore. And because they're all done in public and you can see it all on the blockchain, it's also riskier for you to try and sway someone's opinion, right? So, yeah, I, I would say that I, I don't, what I, perhaps what we could talk about though is what do you do with the rest. Who do you leave behind in this new paradigm? I mean, older people, certainly, but at least, I don't know, at least that they're not going to inherit the earth. It's the younger people that are going to inherit the earth. But what do you do about the people who aren't so open-minded, who eventually, you know, the only thing that gets in the way of truth is time, as Heidegger said. So when it event, if it eventually turns out that these propagandists on this Dorian Johnson hashtag if it eventually turns out that all of these tweets are, are false, what are they going to do? And how do they survive in the long run in a world that promotes truth? So this is the kind of interesting thing we've seen with Ferguson is you see you see a lot of these pro-police people also have to be pro-military and during the Bush administration you saw a huge ramping up of you know militarization on all levels and just spreading this police state all throughout the world but what's happened is now the chickens are kind of coming home to roost you're seeing all of this backlashing and now the cops are being given the same weapons as the military and in a lot of ways when they have, when they've scaled back some of these uh, conflicts or you know as they would call them humanitarian wars the weapons have to come back too and what's happening is they're being distributed to the police departments so I'm wondering if Ferguson is going to result in some sort of policy change I don't really hold out a lot of hope for that but I do think if you can attack, attack the blood of the military industrial complex which is the dollar which is you know you know funding it through this very specific uh, war backed uh, propaganda backed currency you can do a lot of good and I, I think the question uh, we, we do have a question from Dustin Heinrichs and I think this is a this could kind of play into what I'm saying as far as you know is there going to be a policy change or not how do politics kind of come into this? So he says, I got in touch with one of my state Senate candidates on Facebook asking would they be taking Bitcoin, said thinking about it. Do you think Bitcoin will have positive or negative impact on politics and will politics have a negative or positive impact on Bitcoin? And that, that's a good question. I think uh, a lot of us are pretty fed up with the political system. When I see candidates saying that they want to take Bitcoin, I I, I, I have f very mixed feelings about that. You know, I, I on on the one hand, I'm like, cool, people are talking about Bitcoin. On the other hand, I'm like, wait, so you you can take Bitcoin just so you can convert it into fiat and use it for, you know, the same system that uh, has been kind of holding us down in perpetuity. So I I do kind of wonder, uh, what what are your thoughts though on on you know politics and Bitcoin in that relationship is, is something that we need to kind of build outside the political spectrum or is it something that we can uh, you know interact with? I'm building a list of fraudulent professions and politics is at the very top. You've also got economics and you've also got PR. 
as well. Not that the public relations, I often get described as a PR person. I don't know why people describe me like that. The Feathercoin team described me as a PR person. I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, like, there is PR in terms of reputation management. And one of the things I would always say on the Feathercoin forum is that if you don't tell your story the way it needs to be told from your perspective, someone will do it for you. And there is definitely an industry that should be there to try and protect someone's perspective, right? If I've got a perspective on the world and I'm being bombarded by the mob that are trying to overtake, a bit like what these pro-American -mil pro military people are doing with this Dorian hashtag, right? What they're trying to do is they're trying to defend the perspective of the police officer, who they probably justifiably feel is being a bit hard done by here. He's getting summary justice by the mob, and, and they're not wrong. They're wrong to retaliate with more rumor, right? That's just fighting fire with fire. You're just trying to cancel out one wrong with another wrong. But then, but I think that what's happened with the Ferguson hashtag is that you've ended up distorting the picture so in, in, in such a, a violent way that now what's happened is more people are coming along from the other side to, to, to combat it. The real victim here, of course, is nuance, at least in the public discourse. For us, the victim is that we don't have the gray area and the, the detail anymore. We just get black and white. To your point on politics and Dustin's point, and Dustin's been a big supporter of mine, and I want to thank him for continuing to follow me on the videos and ask questions. Um, everyone is a member of the police. Um, and the pro I think the mistake we made uh, with politics was just outsourcing our power and control to a bunch of men in suits in air-conditioned offices really doing nothing except for instructing a bunch of civil servants that worked for the last for the last party, whoever was in power. Really, the, the administrivia doesn't really change. The people actually enacting a lot of the policies don't change. It's just the people that are there in front of the camera and answering the questions, usually with gaffes, let's face it, because usually when a politician goes on camera, they, they screw it up, because really they're just there to lie. And that's all they do. They just lie all the time. They don't care about people. They're just there to enforce the status quo that put them into power in the first place. And they get ever, ever more efficient at getting re-elected each time. But the truth is, everyone's a politician. And everyone can do what they do, or at least can do better what they should be doing. And I heard someone say the other day on, um, it was a really good interviewee, and he's a very famous anti Israel Jewish guy from New York. Anyway, his name will come to me in a minute. He said that politics is about the power you have now. It's about what you can do with what you have right now. That's politics, and he's right. But it's not exclusively there for a bunch of centralized leaders that don't care about you or your concerns. They care about themselves and their friends, and that's what they're there to do. And it's a dying industry. And I think it is dying a slow death. I mean, really, I see my role and, and yours too um, as making this a peaceful transition as possible. This needs to be a peaceful revolution. My concern at the moment is that it won't be. As for politicians taking Bitcoin, I mean, I, don't, I think it's benign. I don't, I don't see any harm in it. I, I don't, I'd be interested to see how they obscure it and whether they even try to. But they're supposed to declare, are they not in America? They are in the UK. They're supposed to declare where their donations come from. So in a way, the blockchain will actually help. But then it can help a, a, you know, an independent candidate too. Yeah, and I think that's where a lot of the focus is with politicians taking Bitcoin. I've been seeing a lot more Libertarian Party candidates taking it or other third party, even Green Party candidates. And I think it would add a level of transparency, which I'm definitely for. Uh, because let's face it, we don't really know where these funds are going. And when it comes to the general elections in this country, you have the same major banks backing both candidates. Oftentimes, uh, you saw this happen in the last election. Uh, you see, I mean, it happens in every election. Uh, obviously, the people are not represented by the representatives. So uh, it, it's very interesting, and I do kind of wonder. I think we've kind of seen what politicians and regulators think of Bitcoin with these New York regulations too. What are what are your thoughts on those? They're a joke and shouldn't really be taken seriously and we shouldn't I don't think we should spend too much time talking about it because I think we talked about it a lot on the on the bitcoin group I only say that because the, a lot of these psychopaths they use your time they feed on your time 
because they know you're never getting it back again. That's why they give you the worthless paper money. Like you want to talk about the kind of money that funds terrorists and drug gangs, let's talk about the dollar then, the most anonymous currency of them all. I mean, sorry, it's anonymous for them, it's not anonymous for you, but it's anonymous for anyone like ISIS right now who is fighting the Americans with American guns. Right, these are guns that the Americans, they ended up getting them. They didn't need Bitcoin for that. They did it all by themselves. And organizations like that will continue to operate in that way. So the idea that we need regulators doing this, no. What they want is a monopoly on policing. They want the evidence held inside of their four walls where they can see it. Not so that you can scrutinize the evidence, no, no. Just so that they can scrutinize the evidence. The, one of the wonderful things we saw out of the MT Gox fiasco was everyone started acting like a police officer, especially if their money had been lost. So everyone was going to Reddit and the Bitcoin talk forum and submitting their, their keys and saying, right, I had this much in, here's my proof of reserves and here's mine and here's mine. And people started piecing the jigsaw together. Hackers hacked into the database, released all the public information, obscured a lot of the sensitive information for to, to hide people's identities. You had the Willy report, which then proved that we had all that manipulation up to 1200. This was citizen policing. And what, what these regulators really want is they want that all to themselves so that they can tell the story about how the crime was committed. What's the first thing a police officer does when they turn up to a crime scene? The first thing they start doing is cordoning off the crime scene. They start putting barriers around it. They put police tape around it. What's the next thing they do? They do evidence control. You've got to take pictures of the crime scene. What's the third thing they do? They start taking witness statements. This is all about getting the narrative down. What happened in what sequence? What's a blockchain really good at? It's really good at tracking the sequence of activities anywhere in the world in real time in such a way that nobody can disagree with, right? Because no one disagrees that one and one equals two. No one disagrees with the fundamentals of maths, no matter what culture you come from. And what the regulators are trying to do is they're trying to say, you're taking away my job. You're automating away my job with a few hundred lines of C++. This is threatening to me. And it's not just threatening to their paychecks, because, you know, they've got enough money they don't need to worry about, at least most of them are higher up. This is really about control. They're about to lose control. Good people that have got you know, the time and the energy, the focus and the, the ambition to sit down and go through a lot of these scams are willing to go through the blockchain. They're willing to go through IP addresses and they're going to go through all the logs. They're going to go on the forums, appeal for witnesses to come forward. They can corroborate that evidence independently against the data that they've got. And then they can tell a new story, a story that is probabilistically true not one that the police force came up with, not one that a judge decided on arbitrarily, or a rigged jury, as particularly the rigged juries that you have in America, where a whole industry exists for jury selection. You have lawyers. I, mean, I heard a statistic once, I don't think this is true, but I, I don't think it's far off, that 10% of Americans work in the legal system. 10% of them. Right, this is a huge industry. But the legal industry is a parasitical organism because the law can't stop time. The court can't come to the crime scene, right? There is something called litigation risk. And if you've got an entire industry for things like jury selection and things like evidence control, you know you've got a problem, right? Because you're just wasting time and energy going over the past. What do you think justice is? Justice is all about controlling someone now based on something called the past, which no one has any control over. And that's what this is, is the monopoly on policing. They just want it to do it all themselves. Yeah, block, the blockchain technology in general is such a threat because it decentralizes so many things. I mean, just, just the concept of something like decentralized justice, decentralized policing, I mean, that's really exciting to me. Even decentralized politics, I mean, if you really want to go that way, it could be done as, you know, as far as voting and things like that. Um, so there's just so many different possibilities. And I think it's really interesting. There is a, a cool kind of comment here. Can I say, this is James Richens, can I say there's a lot of bad political interviewers, and I, I, I'm going to kind of guess what he's saying here. I, 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 I'm pretty sure we're in agreement with this: is people aren't asking these people hard questions. These people who basically make their living off of stolen money from the rest of the country, they're not pushed 
very, very hard on, on questions. I mean, you have someone like uh, the White House press secretary or the, the, pers the PR person for the president. I, I can only imagine that's got to be the worst job in the world. I mean, I, I don't know how people deal with that so long. And, and they're there. you don't see any hardball questions. You see very just kind of soft, delicate questions. And that's because media is also centralized. And who's going to be forming an alliance with media if you want good PR on your side? Well, the centralized government, too. So you see a lot of that as far as, you know, there's not a whole lot of clarity. Politicians are going to be lying to you anyway, but they're also, people aren't really demanding accountability from them. So, and that, that's so much, so much of a bigger problem too. And something, uh, I, I meant to bring this up uh, with, your, with your first point, uh, when, when we were talking about kind of what can you do to protect yourself against liars and that some of these sociopaths, obviously filming them is a good one, but also detecting when someone's lying to you is a really good one. I recently read this book called Lie Spotting uh, by Pamela Mayer. She did a TED Talk on this that I found really intriguing. So I read the book. It's a very quick read, uh, very methodical in her approach for you know picking up on signs that people may be misleading you. And I found it to be very useful because you don't always know if someone's lying to you. You don't, it, it can be kind of hard to tell. Uh, in, in fact, she even made the point that people's ability to lie and cover up their lies is a little bit ahead of people's ability to detect it. So, uh, you know, honesty is something that's really important to me, but I found it to be really useful just kind of in my daily life. And kind of like when you were talking too, just in your, in your business relationships with people, you don't always know if you're going to be ripped off. And I think, the, this applies to the Bitcoin space too. I think there's so many good intentions and so many good projects and enthusiasm behind a lot of things, but there's some very dark elements too. And it's not always hard to tell with all of this, you know, enthusiasm that's around you, you know, who to trust. So I would just say, you know, I would recommend to the people watching Lie Spotting, very quick read, uh, very, you know, uh, easy to use. And I, I think it's something that we need to watch out for and self police in the Bitcoin community ourselves. Does she have the phrase, I think I've seen this lady talk, she has the phrase, duper's delight, which yes. is after they lie to you, they have this little smile on their face, and she's got some really, like, videos that are quite creepy. Uh, the one, one woman who murdered her child, and when she was giving her police interview, after she lied about her, her alibi, she actually smiled. And the duper's delight is this phenomena where it, they lose all respect for you as a victim if you believe their lie. And that's one of the most powerful signals because I, I independently of watching her videos, I was always kind of aware of this phenomena, but she puts a name to it and she does such a good job of case studying it and, and really showing it off to people. But yeah, they, I think a lot of people do know when they're being lied to, but they want to be lied to. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive, but a lot of us want to be lied to. That's why so many people lose money on these exchanges investing in all these altcoins, because they want they want to hear the story about how they're going to get rich and all they've got to do is sit back and you know maybe do some research. It feels like you're working because you know, you're at a computer and you're watching all these trading videos, but that whole industry was set up to con you if you've seen The Wolf of Wall Street, just the first 20 minutes of that film where you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, his character is in the, is in the cafe or the, the restaurant with his boss-to-be, he's just been hired, and he's saying, look, and his boss turns to him and he says, look, I don't care if you're Warren Buffett, I don't care who you are, no one can predict the future, right? Well, this whole thing, it's a scam. We all know it's a scam, but it's like an open secret. It's like one of those social silences, there's those things we don't really talk about but we all know is true. It's just there to exploit the hopeful. Um, and they, they want to believe that they can get rich. They want to believe that their money can make money for them. And, and sadly, it's not true. The people that make the money are the middlemen. Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good point. And uh, to cut out, I, I think this is just a good point from Dustin, again, I just want to show this, those reporters, are they paid a lot of money to play softball with politicians, and you don't get to talk to them unless you make a certain amount of money. And that's certainly true. Um, and as far as different projects that are coming out in the Bitcoin space, there's just so, it, it's hard for me to keep up, honestly, and I'm a bit of a news junkie. I try to follow as much as possible, but it is pretty difficult to keep up with some of these projects that are coming out. And so it, it's hard to know who to trust. Uh, and so Chad, Chad Vincent Estell has a question about that. If you had $10,000 to invest, would you put it into a Bitcoin startup or buy Bitcoin with it? 
So I think this might be a good chance even to talk about the project World Crypto Network is doing. Uh, sure. I probably wouldn't put it into either, Chad. Um, first of all, I over-invested in Bitcoin. I happen to do well out of it, but I'm not a trader. I, do, I don't sit every day watching the charts. I spent a lot of time on BTCE Trollbox, and you can check me in the uh, archives. Um, but I didn't do any trading when I was in there. I was in there telling everyone to get off. Like I would just go in there, and I found it a really refreshing experience. Like I don't know um, how to say it. Like I like inspiring people. I get a sense of well-being from it. I enjoy doing it. I'm, I think I'm good at it. People tell me I'm good at it, and um, and I just like going into those trading rooms. I like going into the chat room. I like saying to someone, "What did you want to be when you were seven? Like, what do you want to do? Like, what do you dream of doing but you've never done yet? What would what would what do you wish you'd said to your boss yesterday? That's a good one as well. People always have an answer ready for that one, and. You kind of say, and, and it kind of wakes people up. You're just what you've got to do is, Kay, is you've got to get inside of people's dreams. You know the way when you're waking up and the radio comes on, and you start dreaming about the song or what's being said on the radio. That's what you've got to do. You've got to get inside of someone's dream, and you've gently, gently got to bring them out of that sleep, because. There's a common saying about mankind that we're like a herd, we're like a pack animal, right? And we only wake up one by one. And if you've already been woken up, it's your duty, it's your obligation to wake other people up too, because that's what a friend would do. I think I don't really have an answer to your question. We can talk about distribute the world, which was an idea that Nick and I kind of came up with over time, just developing different ideas. Nick really kind of knocked it out of the park when he came up with his strategy of like, let's just focus on the regions of the world that already have internet access. So maybe countries that are developing countries but have just started coming online with the internet because these are the people we can already help right and so that way we could send them USB sticks with copies of Linux and copies of the blockchain that 24 gigabytes large right now would take them a year to download not, I'm not even kidding like a year to download but it would only take them a couple of hours in the day to download that day's blocks that would add extra distribution to the network because at the moment Bitcoin only has seven and a half thousand nodes. That's not even as many exit nodes as there are on the Tor network, right? So it's not enough. We need it to be distributed. More dis more distributed it is the more anti-fragile it is, the more resistant it is to take over because there are more copies of the blockchain out there. Um, what was I thinking? Oh yeah, that the internet really um, redefines friendship for us. I think the word love has just completely lost its meaning. We use love for far too many things in our world today, and we don't have enough nuance in the word. The ancient um, Hellenic, uh, you know, ancient Greece had four different words. You had storgo, you had philia, which is friendship, you had agape, which was romantic love, and you had eros, um, and you had eros, of course, which is lust. And they, they categorize them in these four categories. And I think what the internet do, has done is really shone a light on um, philia, which is friendship. It's really starting to get more friendships, like with you, Megan, and like with this show, and like with World Crypto Network, where a group of us just came together gradually over time because we were like-minded individuals. And where we happen to be in the world, well, that's kind of incidental. Like, it's interesting, we talk about it, but it's not the centerpiece of the relationship. Whereas in the past, where you came from, well, that was all it was about. You went to university, not because you wanted an education, you went to university for the social network, because you'd shared the same halls as other people, because you had the same professor as that other guy. That's how you could secure the job in the company. And yeah, sure, people talk about grades, but that's just what they talk about on the news. Everyone knows those grades are nonsense, right? Um, the education system is based on the assumption that the world is knowable, that someone called the examiner knows the whole world, and if you know the world the way they do, you'll get some economic tokens called grades. And that's just not the way the world works. The world is not knowable. The world is unknowable. It is unfathomable. It is rich and complex and surprising. Risk is distributed. And anything could surprise you at any time, often in plain sight. Um, and so the edu education, modern education system most, mostly is a fraud. The vast majority of universities just aren't even worth it. There are a handful that are. In particular, I would single out Stanford University, although I don't like the way they're funded. You know, it's all... Um, to be quite rich to get in, but I love that their media, you know, they're, they're particularly their 
particle physics, their modern physics courses uh, with Leonard Susskind, and I really love as well um, Entitled Opinions, which is a radio show on KZSU um, by Robert Harrison, Professor Robert Harrison, of Italian and French, um, at there at the university. He's an amazing polymath um, philosopher. I don't know. How, I don't know how he likes to describe himself best, but yeah, the, these are the people who are like um, really leading the way because. That the only reason you should ever look down on someone is to help them up, and yet we have grown up as a civilization doing exactly the reverse. That if you met someone that was weaker than you, you would actually use it to hurt them. Like it takes a village to raise a child. Like that is how it was always the case, and that's how it needs to be again. And people need to stop living these free-riding existences where they're able to build these walls around them. And they need to start realizing that you have to justify your existence. You, you have to what you have to make yourself useful. And somebody out there wants what you've got to have, right? If you just get on a camera like this, this is really easy. It takes a bit of practice, but starting is the hardest part. But once you actually go on air and you do it, and if you're just yourself, you're not lying. You're not you know you're not trying to be someone that, that the society wants you to be. You actually be the person you want to be. Guess what? There are three and a half billion people out there. That are going to be waiting to, to and yet someone is going to like it. So I think, yeah, the internet redefines philia, friendship. We're able to build friendships online. First ever commercial business on the internet was Match.com. Did you know that? And the format for how they laid out the page was copied by, well, first by Friendster. Like, so you have like the picture in the top left and followed by a bio down the right. That format, um, yeah, it was copied by Friendster, and then eventually, of course, by Facebook. And it ended up becoming the largest electronic database of human beings in the world. And you really see this idea that borders are imaginary and invisible when you have these relationships you can have with people over thousands of miles. I mean, it's been such a pleasure getting to know you. You're all the way in London. I'm over in the in the U.S. in Florida. And I, I mean, you know. Had this, you know, had this happened years several decades ago, it would have been very difficult for us to meet and and communicate with each other. And you're seeing that with with Bitcoin too. You're seeing this kind of spread out. And I really like how uh, how you said because I remember we've discussed a little bit about this, uh, you know, get, getting uh, you know USB sticks out to people who need help. I think it's great to start, you know, on a practical level with people who already have access to the technology because they're they've already seen how amazing it is and how it just breaks down these barriers between people and they're going to be more likely to use it and once you can get this you know distributed to so many people it, it threatens so many things and it really empowers people too this is a way for uh, you know them to lift themselves out of you know the situations that they've found themselves in whether you know a, a lot of it's through accident a lot of it you know unfortunately a lot of it is through war a lot of it is through imperialism so Bitcoin really provides a way for them to get out, and it, you know what, whether it ends up being you know Bitcoin or not. I mean, it, just the blockchain technology is really showing that. And again, with the internet, people are really, I think, catching on in the past few years, especially how important this technology is and how it can't be stopped. So let's see. It looks like we have uh, we have another question. But let's say what Dustin is saying. So Dustin is saying that, that yeah. I haven't addressed, um, we haven't addressed Chad's central point, which is that he's talking about for profit. Let's talk about the etymology of the word profit. It means progress, profit, right? I'm, I'm saying that you can't keep turning nature and time into money. That if you're looking for a short-term investment, like you're just completely thinking backward. You're stealing from the future, essentially, to pay for today. Someone somewhere down the line, like remember the film Back to the Future where Marty McFly had the picture of his parents and they would fade away and they would come back, you know, as he would do things in that in that moment. And it was kind of very Buddhist in its kind of outlook philosophically, wasn't it? But I mean, it's not that far from the truth. We've got to think about what we're doing to the future. This isn't about the next few days. It's about the next few decades. And we've really got to try and think again about the way the long term relates to the short term. At the moment, I'm stacking trust. I, my, my, my main focus is reputation. Like, I just want to make myself as valuable as I can to a core group of people. And people, and I haven't been campaigning much for money. I haven't been putting up my Bitcoin address and pestering people for all that. 
and and I don't want to either. If if I make myself useful and if I'm just being me and I'm responding to people and people like Dustin come along and they say, well, you know, what do you think about this? And I talk and maybe Dustin, you should come on the show sometime and we can hear what you you know you think about everything as well. Um, then people will pay. You know, that's valuable. But I think people at the moment are impoverished because they're too attached to their lifestyles. Particularly a lot of my friends that I went to school with. I mean, I actually, you know, had a very unfortunate incident. I don't know if it was unfortunate. I don't know how it came across to everyone else, but I was having lunch with a group of people, and the question, as often comes up in Britain, is where do you live? What do you do? And where do you live? And it's all about how much are you worth? How much, as the economy decided? that you are worth and so I want to know what kind of house you live in and of course I have to tell them my living situation which is not which is not permanent and is not you know fixed and secure and it makes everyone feel really uneasy and you don't hear I don't hear from people again after that you know I tell people that and they, they don't talk to me anymore and it's not because they don't like me it's just there's a lot of prejudice and like people just think oh you know it scares them because as soon as they empathize with you as a friend they think I couldn't do that like Chris, you only eat once a day, like, oh, you've got to be careful, you know, and like all this shit. And it's like, well, think about what you're saying for a second, right? You're privileging someone who looks like you over someone who doesn't. Like, when do we start growing up as a species and pricing in the sentiment of the girl that works in Wuhan, China, in that factory who got pregnant last week and is now out of a job? When do we start empathizing with people in the Congo uh, particularly the women there that get raped all the time systematically outside of the copper mines over the, the over the warfare. Just because it's happening somewhere else doesn't make it unjust. You said the other day on Twitter, I saw you said that uh, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere, right? And that and that is absolutely true. And you you don't need to have these lifestyles where you're having a bottle of wine with a meal every day. Like I live a very frugal day-to-day -day existence because I get my pleasure from other people other sources outside of my body a lot of the time just by thinking this by reading books your real wealth comes in not needing all this stuff that you get sold every day the only reason people like advertisers tell you to buy stuff it's not because they think that you'll find it valuable it's because they need to make a return on that investment that they made a couple of years ago Sorry, Chad. That's the answer you get when you ask a couple broke philosophers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask us for an investment device. Right? <laughs> no, I, I like my my personal history in any kind of investing has been abysmal. So, like, I don't know that I could even be trusted with any kind of look. Like, look, look. The, the, the summary. <laughs> the summary is stack trust. Right, you do not want to have money in the next five years because money is worth. The reason they create the money in the first place is so they can take it away. Right, that's why they make it. They want it so that they can remove. They make you want it, and then they can remove it. Do you think rich people are stacking dollars right now? Fuck no. They're stacking hard assets. They're stacking property. They're stacking military weapons and arsenal. They're not stacking dollars. No one in their right mind would do that, except for the middle classes. Unfortunately, and you know, if you are if you are trying to save money in dollars, you're only losing money at this point. Uh, you know, with what they've done with interest rates, if you're putting it in the bank, you're only losing it. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, sorry, Chad. Uh, you know, maybe th there are people who would be able to give a better answer on this, though, uh, that are much more involved in in the trading side of things. Um, so de definitely find those people. I think they'd probably be able to help you. Uh, better with that. Like I said, I haven't much, had much uh, <laughs> much luck w with that. Uh, you know, my instinct would be, you know, if you did have ten thousand dollars, it's your money, but maybe try to diversify it as much as possible. But uh, you know, I think the reason Chris and I are involved in Bitcoin is a little bit different than some of the other reasons people are involved in Bitcoin. Uh, we're very much concerned with getting this technology to the people who need it the most, who don't have dollars at all, who don't have, you know, possessions maybe even that they can really hold on to and that can accumulate wealth. And so I think a, a big part of Bitcoin and uh, just blockchain technology in general is that it frees a lot of people. It brings this kind of prosperity to a larger group of people instead of concentrating it at the very top, which is what you see, which is part of why middle class, you know, middle class people are losing money by keeping money in the bank right now. I mean, it's slowly being whittled away 
And, uh, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. And then the people who are, you know, in the lower rungs, I mean, they have a lot, you know, they, they're struggling through a lot too. You know, they, they can accumulate a lot of capital in a lot of ways. But if you can get them started, for, for example, something interesting that's happened in Pensacola, Florida is where Sean's Outpost is located. And so far, about 11 homeless people have gotten off of the streets and into houses with the help of Bitcoin and uh, Mike and Jason and some of the other people at Sean's Outpost uh, helping them. And they feed homeless people every week through Bitcoin donations. And really, it's enabled us to reach out to people in a different kind of way and that's partly due to I think the philosophy of the Bitcoin community too it's been there's a lot of generosity in this phase so another example uh, Chris ended up I uh, we did they did a fundraiser for Chris to get over here for Bitcoin in the Beltway and Fork Fest. So I think, mm -hmm. I mean, even for something like that, just, hey, you know, I need travel expenses to, you know, get over to another country, can you help me out? They were more than willing to help out with that. I mean, I think that really speaks volumes about the character that's involved in this community and how uh, philanthropic focused they are. Yeah, and that's not getting reported either, and it needs to be. And the thing is that it's all about wealth protection. What the public, what they're trying to do with this economy. When when you put money into the bank, sorry, you're not putting money into the bank. Economists have this phrase called aggregate demand. What that means is that when you put your money into the bank, the bank is investing it. Essentially, you've spent it, and that's how you should think of it. You still have a claim on that money later, but it's only a claim. right? You, the only kind of money you should trust is the kind you can touch with your hands. Right? I'm not necessarily a big metal pusher, but anything that you have in your custody that you have direct control over, that is what's yours. Remember that ledgers themselves are made out of the same particles as the world is, and they are just as fragile as the world Right to disruption. And what, it, what it's turned into, this whole banking system, it's turned into a game of locking profit in and externalizing risk. And if you think you can play them at the same game, well, good luck to you. But I think they're a lot better at it than you are because I think they're greedier than you. I think they're cleverer than you. And I think they've got more information. And more importantly, they don't play a game unless they know they can cheat at the start. And if you come into the game halfway through, you probably can't cheat. And so you're the one that's going to be played. Yeah, the game isn't rigged in your favor at all. It's very much a game that you're playing, and it's not made for you to win. It's made for the people who invented the game to win. Uh, and I, I view politics much the same way. This is a system that doesn't, it's not, it's not meant to help people. It's, it's meant no. to control them. But um, because people see it work sometimes, because you get those rare things, those rare events of someone making it, because it's allowed to happen sometimes doesn't mean that it's the norm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this is a, a, another good comment by Chad. My feeling is that if Max Kaiser is right and Bitcoin goes to a million dollars someday, that would mean that the petrodollar has fallen and that would be exceedingly great. And uh, yeah, and hopefully by that time we'll, we'll stop thinking of Bitcoin in terms of it, their dollar worth. Because I, I think it's very important. Yeah, to keep I mean, a can of baked beans could cost you $100,000 when that happens, right? And so mm -hmm. it won't be so much that Bitcoin has gone up in value. It will be, but you've got to remember that the internet runs on dollars too. And those cables that run under the ocean belong to Google and they belong to a lot of centralized institutions. In fact, recently Google have been reinvesting in the cables under the Atlantic because sharks have been eating them and they've had to file patents for protective technologies and stuff. The internet runs on a lot of these organizations that have a strong position in dollar industries or in the American industries, right? So at the moment, we are not free yet. Um, and I think a lot of people are telling themselves the same fantasy that, that Kaiser and Tour de Mista, and don't get me wrong, but these are smart people. Let me just pull this up. These are, they, I'm not saying that these guys aren't smart people, but this right here is called post hoc rationalization. It's where someone looks back over the history of things they've said and they find in, interesting coincidences and say, look, I'm going to take the credit. This is what politicians do. They take the credit for every happenstance that takes place under their watch and it kicks every problem down to the next guy who gets elected. Right. Yeah, it's easy to go through your tweets and say that you were right in this, but what about all the times when you were wrong? And the problem is, is that no one can predict the future, not Tour, not Max, nobody. The future is, by definition, unknowable. That's what makes it what it is. 
And I think it also depends on what you mean by great. Uh, if the dollar were to collapse, it would be pretty shitty for a lot of people for a really long time yeah, because really there's would. a whole lot of people who are relying on, on certain systems, you know, whether or not you can debate the, uh, you know, morality of the systems or whatever. There are a lot of people who are relying on, you know, these other systems, and it, it would greatly harm them too. So I, I think... I think we'll... Go ahead. I think what pe people are telling themselves a dream, and the dream goes something like this. When, it, when World War Three kicks off, I'll be on the Cayman Islands watching it all on TV because I was the one who got in early and sold at the high and then went off and, went, and then I can watch it from a distance. It's the same thing with these MRAPs. Everyone's got this private little fantasy of theirs, you know, this, this military vehicle that can resist landmines. Where at all like these drones, these supersonic drones that can go anywhere in the world within an hour. So America's borders are now, you know, everywhere. America is the world now because it can get to anywhere. And you've got these these military guys playing computer games in Nevada, dropping bombs in West Pakistan or East Pakistan, wherever it is, right? And to them, these people are like, <clears throat> excuse me, far away. And everyone's telling themselves these stories about how all of this chaos and all they'll be shielded from it. I'll be inside of my, you know, safe little MRAP, or I'll be, you know, playing the game and I'll be shooting the bad guys, or I'll be on that beach with my bitcoins because I was smart. Everyone tells themselves the story about how the future is going to be good for them. And what you've got to realize is that you're not the only one. And as soon as you realize you're not the only one, you realize that all that really matters is what's now, what's right in front of you. And people need to start acting like that because that future hasn't come into existence yet. And it's highly unlikely that it ever will. Right. And maybe something that would be great would be to see the structures propping up the petrodollar collapse in some sort of way, such as military industrial complex. And this is something that is it, it I mean it spans worldwide and its toxicity and it's it, I, again it is fueled by dollars but it's also backing the dollar too and we're you know we're see we're seeing the results of this every single day we're we're seeing uh you know the people are being stretched further and further and it's it's definitely uh it, it definitely makes you concerned about the future and when I got into Bitcoin I didn't get into it with a mindset that I was going to make a lot of money I I bought a few and I was I was very kind of like well, we'll see where this goes, because uh, I'm very comfortable with the fact that I can't predict the future. I think a lot of people are very afraid, and, and they uh, look to gurus, and they look to some of these other people who can predict these things, and they say, oh, well, I know the truth about this, or I know, I, I'm, you know, this is absolutely going to happen eventually. And, and there are certain things you can predict, maybe from an economic standpoint, that might happen because of certain policies. But what it comes down to is you just simply don't know, and you know, one day you, you may be in a very privileged position one day, and the next day you may be getting attacked somehow. I, I think really uh, this is, isn't very uh, comfortable to talk about in the U.S., but with as far as we've been stretched worldwide, as you know, with as much destruction that we've been doing, I think it's only a matter of time before it backlashes in a very much more real way, even worse than something like 9-11. I'm not making any predictions because, again, I can't tell the future. And I, I think anyone who thinks they can uh, really shouldn't be trusted. But it, it's very important to consider that it's very easy for us to look at these things as very distant and very far away, and it's not something we're ever going to have to confront. Because really, when it comes to funding these things, you have to confront a part of yourself and how much you play a role in that. And obviously, some people play larger roles than others, but ultimately, you know, everyone is playing a role of some kind, and you have to take responsibility for that. And if you find yourself in a comfortable position, I think you should be very concerned. I, I think it's good to always be a little bit uncomfortable and uncertain of what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, well said. So let's see. We have uh, some good, good questions. Uh, Alan Bell has joined us. He's been he has. Uh, he's been following me for a bit, and I, I don't know if you've had uh, Alan on your show as well. So I have. I haven't had him on the show yet, but hello, Alan. Thanks, and thanks everyone, uh, Chad, and and everyone else for your input. This is this is really really awesome. I do like what what Alan is saying here. So if people have an identity crisis, they often say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Marine, I am a housewife, um, defining themselves with these kind of labels. Um, you know, even, and I, I do uh, kind of wonder, I mean, I, I guess 
I'm, everyone's guilty of that on some level. So it's like I say, I'm a Bitcoiner, but maybe that's not as accurate. Like I am a blockchain technology enthusiast, maybe, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Because mm -hmm. there's just so, you know, there's just so, so much out there to just separate to one. I even had, uh, I was kind of debating on what should I call this interview show that I'm doing? Because before I had done a bunch of interviews, just kind of with with my friends, basically uh, in the Bitcoin space on YouTube, and I didn't really title it as anything. It was just like, you know, I'm interviewing, uh, you know, whoever. Uh, but I wanted to put a little bit of a name to it, so I tried to keep it broad, you know. And I, I it's something that I we don't always have to talk about Bitcoin stuff on this show. I really like to get into the social issues, the, the you know, greater kind of philosophical kind of worldwide issues too. Uh, so I, I think, I, you know, something that I'm kind of learning as I'm getting older is, you know, the labels are less and less necessary. I don't like to really, uh, you know, there's a good quote about it. I don't wear labels because they keep falling off. Right. And, uh, you know, I really like People it. People get I know attached. You, they get yeah. attached to their labels. And they when feel someone, like they have to fulfill that, whatever yeah. that label is, you know, they, they, they're stuck to that. And that, that creates a box around you and it inhibits growth in a lot of ways. When someone tells me they're a Christian, I don't assume they live by the Ten Commandments. I assume that they aspire to. I assume that when they tell me that they're a Christian, that that's what they want me to associate them with as part of their identity. I don't assume they do. I've never met a Christian or a Muslim or any of these religious people actually live by the doctrines that their religious texts tell them to. All I see is somebody talking about it, but I rarely see anybody actually living it. Well, and yeah, I think that's an even greater problem with it. We're so quick to add these labels onto ourselves, but very, very flimsily and without much depth, you know, uh, without much uh, thought sometimes even. Maybe it's trendy. Maybe it sounds cool. Maybe it sounds really edgy, you know, like uh, even something like, uh, and, and I used to identify as this, I, I don't anymore, but something like anarcho-capitalism. Here's these two terms that are like, oh, they're so radical, and they're both buzzwords in their own way. You know, mm -hmm. people are very confused about what anarchism means, very confused about what capitalism means. You combine them together, and I think it kind of makes people's heads explode sometimes, too. But it's very, you know, kind of like edgy and like kind of cool sounding to some people. So I, uh, nothing against my ANCAP friends. I, I love you guys. But, uh, mm. but yeah, I mean, I, I do wonder, in, in other labels too, I mean, not I don't want to just, you know, I'm not trying to pick on ANCAPs or anything, but anyone who, you know, is trying to embrace something, it, it puts you in a box. Or, you know, it's really maybe more signaling too. I wonder how much we're just kind of signaling. To others, it, so. it is. Um, it's branding exercise. Look at what's happening with the Islamic State right now. This is, and we've we've got all this news on British media at the moment because some of these guys involved in the beheading of the American journalist have British accents. And what that's a surprise to us that you know. And then you've got a lot of Muslims saying on 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 the news they're saying, well, this isn't Islam. This isn't a religion at all. This is just people using the name. And it's the same on the internet. This is this is SEO. This is SEO in real life, people just using labels and syntax and symbols and attaching it to their actions. This is all about the way we attach identity to action. And people will just stick labels on all kinds of things. It doesn't mean it's true. And I think what cryptography does, and I think you're right to call it crypto convos, that's also why I think Tom chose World Crypto Network instead of World Bitcoin Network, was because cryptography is all about the way we relate to the hiddenness. Well, how do we relate to the thing we cannot see? Cryptography is all about concealment. It's the art of concealing things. Um, and I think that's very profound in our age because so far in, in our civilization, throughout our human history, we've always associated the face. In fact, I think that's what anthropos means. I think anthropos, where, where man comes from, some, the, the one with the face. I can't remember. Someone, will, I'll look it up later and I'll clarify it. But it, it, your action was always with your face because you couldn't do things at a distance like you can now, right? I can move all kinds of things just with a touch of the button these days. But in the old days, it was all about what you could move. It was about physical strength, right? And so now this idea that you can you can create all these identities online, you can set up these email accounts and log into here and set up a new identity, take a picture from somewhere else, make it look like it was you. I mean, it's yeah, it's it's all it's it, that's what it's all about. 
So we live very publicly now. I mean, every everyone is very you know open and a lot of you know especially if you're using social media a lot. I mean, you're you're living life you know very very publicly. Uh, but there's still that kind of urge for privacy, and the, you know that's only allowed you know for a certain people for a certain amount of people. I was reading this interesting article today about Vladimir Putin and how he's been so successful at hiding the history of his uh, wife and daughters. I mean, it's like impossible. I mean, he's like somehow just erased them from things, and this is this was done a lot in the Soviet Union, erasing history, and it's becoming harder and harder to do that because with something like cryptography too, I mean that you can have these private records now. I mean you can you can have these um, you know so you, you'd have these sources. you can you can even encode things into the blockchain. Now. I mean it's something like uh, you know proof of publishing where you can you know put put events or you could put it, I think this would be great. I mean if, if you were at a rally or something you're at a protest like Ferguson, you know you um, you're taking down this information. You're putting it into the blockchain. You're you're adding on to history and you're creating history. And it can't be you can't like roll it back and erase it. You know, like you can't go back and be like, oh, well, this didn't really happen. You know, or these people didn't really exist. And it's so hard these days too to kind of discern fact from reality, uh, especially you know with Ferguson. It's just so convoluted and just so so out there it's very hard to follow R reporting sometimes it's just abysmal so you really have to be vigilant about that and you really kind of have to know who to trust too it's, it's kind of hard to find out who you can trust and that kind of leads me into this uh, really good question by Tim hey Tim <laughs> so Tim Fry Roberts and Roberts he is saying there's so many sources of information a few better than the rest what is your daily routine for information gathering what sources do you use for news finance technology and pew politics that's a great question and Tim by the way I still have it it's here on my desk the silver bullet that you gave me thank you very much I, I that close um, it's it's a per, it's a brilliant question. Um, do you do you want to answer it first? Or? So that's that's interesting. I, I like to look at a lot of different sources and try to find something. There, there's some for me. Truth is oftentimes in that gray area, kind of in that middle ground too. So I like to look at news aggregate sites that kind of take news from a lot of different sources. Uh, Tim actually turned me on to Freedom's Phoenix, which uh, I go on Ernie Hancock's show, Declare Your Independence, every now and then. I think that's pretty interesting. You get a lot of different perspectives. Um, so I, I read kind of a broad amount. I mean, I read everything from the super far right. Like sometimes I wait until like neo reactionary you know, literature and stuff, all the way to super far left, like Mother Jones, mm -hmm. stuff like that, and I try to analyze what's being said in between. Um, so it's hard for me to really trust a lot of kind of more mainstream sites. Like, I found myself being really disappointed, as far as finance sites, like, I'm really disappointed in Business Insider and Forbes. I think they do a pretty awful job, e even from an editing perspective. I, it doesn't seem like they put a whole lot of care into that. So I don't really know the best sources as far as finance news. Um, but yeah, I, I just kind of like to take a look at a, a broad variety of sources. I, I like some of the stuff on Reason. I think Reason.com is a really good source. They're going to be libertarian leaning, but they tend to have a very balanced perspective on what's going on. They tend to do really good research. Uh, Vice sometimes is actually really thorough. It depends on the writer. One of my favorite Vice writers is Lucy Steigerwald, and she writes some excellent, excellent stuff about, or she, she mainly focuses on police brutality, but she also writes a lot of, she writes for antiwar.com too, and just really great material on, on war and foreign policy and stuff like that. Antiwar.com is a really good source for foreign policy. I mean, I, I don't know that I've found a source actually that rivals them as far as scope. I mean, they really have people everywhere who are doing some serious reporting, and I really think they're kind of overlooked. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, but yeah, antiwar.com, I really love them, you know, Vice, uh, Vice actually has pretty good documentaries, too. Some of their articles, you know, it's like hit or miss sometimes, but some of their documentaries are just really good. They did a really good one about North Korea um, that I would yes, highly recommend. That was very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, as far as technology, I mean, you know, I, I like looking at the Bitcoin forums and stuff for that. I mean, like, I'm very much, uh, as far as technology goes, I like Wired. Wired.com is great. And Wired, I used to get Wired Magazine 
uh, back in the day too. Um, so you know, Wired I think is a good source for technology, but also just uh, you know keeping in touch with Bitcoin Magazine too. Is I mean, there's constantly articles about new projects coming up in there. Uh, so th those are the sources I kind of like. What about you, Chris? I think what you've you, you've said there is just perfect because the truth doesn't lie in the middle; it lies at the edges. So you've got to be looking at the extremes. Go to the far right. Go to the far left. Go to the neocons. Go to you know the the Rothbardians. You know, go through all of the different polars. Um, I, I, let, let's put it this way: it's not about who you can trust; it's the way you trust. You've got to trust. You've got to change the way you form the trust in the first place, and really make people work for it. Right? Really place a value over your over who you trust in the world. For me, it's it's all of what you just said. Plus, you've also got to have a system. So my system involves Pocket um, and uh, Evernote, which I use for clippings on the web. So every time I go to a website, most I, and I also use um, what do I use? What's it called? You've probably seen it when I do screen share. It'll come up any minute now if I click on this. It's um, a succession manager anyway in, in Google Chrome. So I do all my research in Chrome. I don't. I use multiple browsers. I use Firefox um, for like Facebook and evil stuff like that. I use Safari for charts because I noticed that it works better with you know all those kind of um, um, plugins and stuff. But I will use Chrome because it's light, it's fast, and it has the most plugins. And then all the stuff I do, I highlight, I annotate, I go through it all, I let it percolate. I don't fall for shit. If, if somebody tries to, to tell me something, I think to myself, what does this person have to gain from me believing in this? What action does this make me feel like taking if I were to believe in it? Who might benefit from that action? Oh, I see what you've done there. I see that you're just telling me this because you want me to go off and buy this product. And then I see if I do a bit more digging that actually this was an advertorial and not an editorial. And usually you can tell that most of the time these days anyway. So go onto the IRC channels, go to Bitcoin Talk, wade through the trolls. Um, don't give them too much time. Don't answer them. Don't, don't engage with them. But just skim through. Read the first sentence of every paragraph. That's another common trick. Go to the end of the thread first. Let's see where it's up to now. And then go back to the beginning and read from there. And use lots of these techniques. And just really you know, immerse yourself in it. And really get to know and become a trustworthy person within the community. Because people will respect you. You will get more followers on your social media channels if you start to become a reputable source of information. Because people will use you as a shortcut because of all that work you've done. And this goes back to the point we had just now on reputation capital. That you need to be trusting. You need to be building trust. Don't just stack silver. Stack trust. And that you raise a really good point. There are certain people that I follow just because they seem to have a fine-tuned approach to research and really, you know, wading through the details and pulling out the truth of things. So there are even individuals on social media that I follow because their commentary is good and because they, you know, they have a balanced perspective on things. And something that I wrote a while back, it's on my personal blog, and I have, I've been thinking about going back and actually just rewriting this article to make it a little more broad. Uh, the title is called The Responsibility of Reticence, and it was I wrote it after the Boston bombings uh, that happened, and which was a really tragic situation, but basically I take the same approach when any tragic situation happens, and that's one of kind of silence and sitting back and observing what's coming out and what's happening. And I've tried to do the same thing with Ferguson. I mean, I get so infuriated by what's going on. So, of course, if you, follow, if you look at my Twitter, it's like, you know, it's my, you know, angry Megan tweets, tweet time. But, uh, but yeah, basically the, the, the whole point of the article is, you know, whenever something crazy happens, people just need to take a breather, step back, and wait until the facts come out. Because you don't know the truth about anything went immediately after it happens. Everyone has an opinion, but you know, opinions are like assholes. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter what's being said at the very beginning of a tragedy. Or it, it, it matters what's being said at the end. It matters, you know, the research that comes out of that. Well, you know, what, who's doing the hard reporting on these things? You know, we, we, you simply don't know and to kind of pontificate ignorantly about these things without 
you know, before something's even ended, like with Ferguson, I mean, people are already saying that, you know, this, I already know what's happened, you know, I'm completely firm in my, you know, beliefs in something, uh, you know, whatever happened, and, and evidence is still coming out. And videos are still coming out about the police brutality. This is a, still an ongoing thing. And you even saw it happen with Robin Williams, too. I mean, I saw some very strange things coming out um, after Robin Williams passed away. I mean, I found it very strange how quick people were to assign blame or to uh, kind of create scenarios that weren't really backed up by anything but their imagination. And uh, so it's something I, I just try to sit back and absorb things, uh, you know, kind of as they come and not really fall for anything. I mean, I've been guilty of doing this in the past. You know, I've been guilty. Yeah, I have biases of my own that I'm constantly trying to kind of check. You know, if something, for instance, you know, I, a, a bias that I'll readily admit is I'm not very pro-cop. I think anyone who knows me would say that I'm, I'm pretty, you know, anti-police in general. So when the Trayvon Martin thing happened, immediately I, I assumed that, you know, uh, George Zimmer, I, it was George Zimmerman was in the wrong, for example. And evidence kind of came out, and it ended up being a way more nuanced and complicated situation than any, and then either side was making it really. So, and I've learned lessons before, you know, from various other things, just jumping to conclusions, and it's just, just way better to kind of sit back and, you know, wait for the dust to settle, so to speak. Yeah, very good. So, What's uh, Alan saying? Al, Al, Alan's got some really good, oh man. He's great. He is, yeah, oil I'm, is, I'm oil is control, it is not just about the petrodollar, we are bathed in oil, yeah man, you're a man off my own heart, I Absolutely. keep telling people this whole world is made out of oil, like Absolutely. it's running everywhere. It is, yeah, that's a good one, and this is, you have to gain enough knowledge to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff, be a jack of all trades, master of one. So uh, so that that is really interesting too, I kind of find myself wading into a wide variety of territory and I... Uh, yeah, it's, and it's kind of, sometimes I find myself, I, I think I'm a little bit too distracted, maybe. Like, maybe I try to, like, cover too many things at one time, but I just can't, you know, it's, it's hard for me to kind of Do you stop know what that. I think that is? I think it's guilt. I think what holds a lot of us ADHDers back is that we feel guilty. And I think often, I, I'm certainly guilty of this, as I overcommit. And I'm, I'm too quick to say yes to people when they ask me for things. And then I think, oh, I shouldn't have said that because I can't really do it, right? But I want to. I really, really want to do it. Um, God, I do that and, all the time. Yeah, and it's just, but now I've just learned to let go. I've learned not to reply to every email in my inbox. I've learned not to say, to talk to every person that talks to me in Skype and just like, just exist where I am, belong to where I am, and just have the most impact with what I can do right now and stop feeling guilty about the thing that you haven't done that you only think you should have done. But that's almost never what you should be doing right now. Absolutely. And uh, I just wanted to put this up here because I, I know uh, Nathan, too. Nathan Wozak says, hi, Chris. No questions, just a quick hello. Yeah. Hey, hey, Nathan. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Oh, Nathan's great. So let's see. Alan has... Oh, this, this kind of seems like a question. Yeah, here we go. How to get Bitcoin in the hands of a billion people. So you were kind of talking about the uh, well, crypto network uh, projects, and th there are a lot of other projects too. Um, it's kind of, what, what do you think are maybe the biggest challenges right now to getting it more widely adopted around the world? You know, when we're talking, you know, billions of people. Um, I mean, you know, what is it going to take to get one billion? Right now, my biggest challenge is other people in Bitcoin, because that they're, they're not. They're not proactive. We are. You are. Nick is. Um, Tom, you know, I can call on any of you anytime, and I know that you'll join me on a video or you'll do something, but I'm having a real tough time persuading the trolls in the Reddit to get off their ass and get from, out from behind that chart and just do make yourself useful. You know, do something. Tell someone about it. Um, but, you know, I was with Hugh the other day in London. He's got, he runs a company called Quit Bitcoins, and they've got one of the first ATMs in London operational. It's turning over money. We had the Chancellor, George Osborne, actually go and buy some Bitcoins on this thing. And it looks like Hugh and his company are doing a really good job of educating people. We had some people setting up paper wallets 
um, we were teaching them how to to get online, you know, and get with multi-bit and all this kind of thing. So we're going to do that more. But really, yeah, it's it's within the community itself. Look at when we tried to get Jenna Marbles to take donations, right? All of a sudden, you had these Bitcoiners saying, well, why should we give Bitcoins to Jenna Marbles? She's not even a Bitcoin believer, is she? It's like, why are you doing this us and them? We're back to labels, back to categories. Is this dichotomy between us and them. And so that's that's the treacle. But, you know, what we're doing is we're getting like-minded people to join us from regions of the world that, uh, you know, like Nick is saying, is ju are just coming online. So I'm meeting Mitch from Ghana next week. He's coming to London on holiday. He's an expat. He's American, but he lives in Ghana, and he's IT literate. Like he, I think he's an engineer of some kind. And I'm going to give him a memory stick, and we're going to, you know, put Linux on there, and we're going to put the blockchain on there. And uh, he's going to take it back with him, and he can make copies, and he can give them out to people and teach them how to do it. It just, it just has to be, you know, a ground swell and a ground movement across the world. Yeah, I agree, and I think a lot of times it's kind of hard to balance that urge to want to reach out to all of these billions of people who really need it in these other countries with what can, how can I spread it in my local community. So I think that's that's a very difficult part. It's obviously harder to get it out to other parts of the world at the moment, but there are a ton of people who are actively working on this too. Um, there, there are people in, in Botswana, for example, uh, who, are, who are doing Bitcoin meetups. Uh, you know, pe people are getting active, and I think a lot of it does start kind of locally, though, and yeah. being able to sit down and talk, talk with your friends, first of all, your family members, kind of get them on board, see if they understand, but also kind of fish for curious people, too, because ultimately you don't want to spend a whole lot of time on someone who's not that interested. Right. But if you keep talking about it, what I've, what I've noticed is, you know, I've been talking about it for a long time now, and, uh, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, were, were kind of sick of seeing, you know, my Facebook posts and stuff like that. Uh, but it's kind of planted these little seeds. So now, you know, when, when Bitcoin does start moving more, things like that, it, people have been coming to me lately like, oh, you seem to know a lot about Bitcoin. You know, can you tell me more about it? And those are the people that I want to reach the most. So, you know, if, if you have a lot of energy and time or even a little bit of energy and time to dedicate to talking to people about this technology, focus on those who are most interested and engaged and who want to learn and set them up with some Bitcoin. You know, you send them a little bit of coin, you know, set them up with a wallet. It's pretty easy to do that. Uh, you know, do what Chris did. So, it, you know, it definitely starts with you and your motivations of, you know, who you want to get this technology to. So yeah, uh, and everyone right. can do it, you know, even if you're, you, a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm just one person. Well, no, there's a ton of people doing Bitcoin educational outreach. It's about, um, I mean, it's about, lots, of, it's about lots of one people acting simultaneously in an organized fashion. That's how all these corporations work. They work because they get a group of individuals to act simultaneously on a sequence of events. That's how it works, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to get organized. Mm-hmm. And this is a good comment from Nathan Wisnock. I wholeheartedly agree how on earth are we expected to bridge the gap between the Bitcoin community and the rest of the world if we aren't more open and helpful. We have to keep it simple and we have to be open, warm, and welcoming. So yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And it's something that I, I think is um, the people who are interested in doing outreach, uh, who, are, who are very, very invested in the educational side of things, are very warm people. I've noticed. I mean, I, I just interviewed Will Pangman a couple weeks ago. He's extremely active, very nice person, very, I mean, just very, very pleasant to be around. And it, it is amazing how the people who are best suited for that kind of outreach tend to just find it, like the, the best personalities for it seem to kind of find it. So, and I know a couple women have told me they're more comfortable talking with women, uh, you know, so I, I've talked with a few women about Bitcoin, you know, I think uh, sometimes women are more comfortable, you know, approaching you to talk about it than they are some of the other guys. So, and I know there's whole uh, entire women in Bitcoin groups who are dedicated to reaching out to women too. So uh, there, there's a lot of people doing a lot of really good work, and you can even look up, you know, look up, look for the meetups too. I mean, that's a great source to meet, you know, meeting people in real life. You know, there, if you're near a big city, it's likely that there's a meetup close to you. Um, so, and hopefully you see those popping up more and more. We've, we've had mixed success with uh, the ones here in Pensacola, but, you know, it's something we still plan on, uh, you know, keeping up and, and trying to do. You know, people are 
slowly but surely, I think, kind of coming around and on, you know, just persistence. So, let's see. Okay. Another question from Dustin Heinrichs. Let's say some of the audience has a lot of Bitcoin and wants to invest to have the best long-term social impact. What should they do? Aside from buying more Bitcoin, which I assume the whole audience is doing. I wish, yeah, I wish I could be. I don't have much money at the moment, but I, uh, if you, so there's a bunch of Bitcoin charities, for example. Um, you know, some of my favorites are Sean's Outposts. I, I'm the editor of Bitcoin Not Bombs. Uh, you know, antiwar.com is doing a fundraiser right now where you can donate Bitcoin. Uh, BitGive is another good one. Uh, Bitcoin 100 takes an approach that is, is interesting. They, uh, they give Bitcoin to various charities, at, you know, at one time. So uh, they're constantly looking for new charities to be added. Um, so what, what, what do you think, Chris? Uh, you know, yeah, what are some of your... Uh, well, I think uh, long-term social impact, that's interesting too, though. So. Some, someone with very little Bitcoin can have way more impact than someone with a lot of Bitcoin simply by sharing their enthusiasm and their energy and helping other people learn why it is that you find this so powerful, right? What do you find so amazing about this? And we, When we did a talk at Leeds in front of a bunch of bankers and investors, we had a very good question from the audience that I wasn't expecting. Maybe my own prejudices and filters were coming through. Um, and he said, why do you find Bitcoin so valuable? Not it doesn't have a value and it's all worthless and it's virtual and you can't you know, see it and stuff like this. But he asked why. And that was a very, very good question. And you have to start by listening to the other person's needs first. And if Bitcoin isn't right for them, like with Richard Bose, where he had that very sobering chat with Stephanie on Let's Talk Bitcoin recently, and he was talking about his experiences in Kenya, and he was very upfront, and he was very open and candid, and he said, look, could have gone better, if I'm honest. Um, didn't really work out, because there are all kinds of other barriers to entry that they have in Kenya, and they're just not ready for it yet. And not to mention the entrenched uh, political positions um, with the safari con right where they they've got their feet in all the under the right tables like you're not going to get you're wasting your time and what's happened with world crypto is that we've got people from we've got a guy in nepal we've got a guy in ghana a guy in venezuela a guy in thailand a couple of guys in thailand now that are watching us um and they say look actually we know how to do this i, I i'm been here for 10 years or i'm a local here and i think i can do this and all i need is x and we know that we can deliver that, and then we can help them give everything they need to get what they need to do on the ground, right? The problem with charity is that charities don't work because it doesn't scale, because generosity doesn't scale. You've got to build these kinds of, you know, value for value exchanges that, that just, you know, we've got an economy at the moment that relies on new money all of the time. But you can't keep having new money all the time because that's just the same as saying the money isn't very valuable. Whereas Bitcoin is full asset reserve, and although it's going through an inflationary period, because markets are future pricing mechanisms where people anticipate the future and bring it into the present with their current action, what that means essentially is that this money just has to keep going around. Everyone cannot get rich at the same time. It's impossible. If everyone gets rich at the same time, that's the same as saying nobody is. Right? So you can't just have everyone increasing their bank balances, which, which is what you have at the moment. So it, it requires an entire paradigm shift. They have to completely rethink things. And the only way you can do that is by appealing to the people that are already halfway there. When, what is the, the saying that when the teacher is ready, when the student is ready, the teacher will come? Yeah, that's a good point. And this is something we've kind of, I, I was, I did a panel with Jason King and Davi Barker and Andres at Bitcoin in the Beltway, and we discussed the kind of broken nonprofit model. And th there's a lot of problems with charities. Now, there are a few charities that I do trust. Those were the ones I mentioned. And, you know, they're having a good impact on individuals. And I think that that's a good way to start because it's a very hard question. And it's a very good one, Dustin what is the best long-term social impact? That's, that's very difficult to predict, but I do know that you can donate to certain Bitcoin charities that are helping people on an individual level. And some may argue, oh, well, that's only small scale, whatever. I mean, that's still, you know, quality of life, life being improved. Uh, but yeah, I mean, 
ultimately you can you can also invest in education. You can do re, you know outreach with it uh, yourself, getting other people joining in to the network too. So very very good question. That was that was uh, it was a hard one, very hard one because that kind of goes in back into what we were saying about you know, predicting the future. How do you you know how how do you know it's going to have the best social impact? Uh, so it's it's very hard, but I, th I think we'll see, and I think we're seeing a lot of uh, changes kind of coming to the charity structure, too. So I, I'm very excited to see that. Um, let's see. Got a couple more. Let's see. So it looks like Alan has a YouTube link, a Global Awakening, so I'll leave that up there for people who are interested in viewing that. Um, and oh, that, that's so sweet. Thank you, Alan. Hello, you are heroes of humanity. People would rather have any identity than being a human being. They always want and have always been told they are so much more. So this is the etymology of the anthropos that I talked earlier, and it, I was right, it is the face of a man. But it also has a lot to do with strength as well. Where is it? And a man, opposed to woman, boy. Uh, vigorous, vital, strong, right? So it's, it's the face and the strength. And those two things used to be coincidental, but they are no longer. And it turns out that now is what, it, what is true is our ability to keep creating more and more identities as much as our organizational capacity will allow us to. And I do kind of wonder what effect that has because you can create all of these identities and there is this degree of anonymity when you're making like sock accounts and stuff like that. And it could be, you know, it could be a lot of fun, you know. Uh, I think in a lot of ways, um, you know, when people create extra accounts that are, you know, anonymous that aren't linked to their personal account, it allows them to kind of act out some of the internal uh, frustrations that they have, the kind of internal things that, you know, maybe they don't, you know, maybe sometimes it's kind of ugly, you know, in the case of trolling, it can be really ugly, but maybe that's a release that has to happen so that people aren't that way in their personal lives when they when you kind of fragment your identity. I think there's dangers to it if you're fragmenting your identity too much, but I do kind of wonder if there is some kind of benefit to this. You're, you're kind of separating certain maybe negative aspects of your identity. Now, I don't agree that those negative aspects should be taken out on other people, Obviously, uh, but it is it is a, an interesting phenomenon. We've never had uh, quite the opportunities we have now to create so many personalities and almost anonymously, like you said earlier. I mean, it's just a matter of coming up with you know a fake name and a fake picture, and you have an entirely new identity. And you know, it can be completely different from the one that you actually are. What are yeah, your thoughts but, but on it's, that? But, it, but it's because your actions are separate, not because we are separate. There's no such thing as anonymity. Anonymity is right. an illusion of time. So you have pseudonymity, and you can do things under certain pseudonyms. But like DNA, you're leaving your identity everywhere. Right? Identity exists independently of time. It's what remains true after everything about you changes. So you can weave these narratives, and you can tell these stories. But with enough information, we can work out who you are eventually. The future will know. Your peers, your contemporaneous peers may not know who you are. But eventually, someone will uncover that hard drive or they'll decrypt that, that you know, hack into that account. And they will work. I mean, even with stylometry. Stylometry is the, the analysis of your style of writing, right? So if you wrote something under an account a few years ago and you think that you got away with it, well, you probably haven't if you're writing now under your real name on a blog because, you know, you need to start a business doing that or something. Um, and of course, that will all be reconciled, and so we will find, you know, you will be found out eventually. And that's interesting. I, I've been kind of been looking into that also. I mean, it, just the rate at which technology is developing to find these things out is really fascinating to me. It's a bit scary at the same time, but it does keep you in check as far as, you know, nothing you do is private, really, on the Internet. You know, if you're writing something, I mean, they can pick up on your writing style. And I do kind of wonder, do you think they'll ever find out Satoshi, who Satoshi Nakamoto is based on some of this? Well, God, gods have this habit of coming down, giving us something great, and then leaving. Right, that's what gods do throughout history, and also you have to remember that a lot of these, a lot of the most successful religions in history, and I would class money as a as a religion. It's something that everyone agrees on, right? Um, 
it's a belief system. What they did is they told a story about how the sky related to the earth, whether it was Uranus and Gaia in the Greek mythology or, you know, heaven and earth in Christianity, right, where, you know, Jesus would come down and he would die for us and then he would have the, he would bring the mortal experience to God, the one that can't die, would now know what it was like to be human and now God is complete, okay? And, and so all of these religions have this have this narrative and if you can control that narrative if the people that want the information relate to you as someone who they believe has the information that they need you have control over those people and I think that yeah we're, we're just seeing more of that and also don't forget that technology isn't something that other because you keep using this externalized personal pronoun like they right like that they will do it. No, 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 you, 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 because you're the one that's using the technology, right? And then, then the companies make it, they're looking at the way you're using it to build more of it. One of the reasons why we've got all these, you know, uh, sexting culture, you know, where people are sending pictures, is because when the companies did their research, that was what the kids told them that they wanted, right? They didn't build it, you know, WhatsApp or whatever didn't build that app so that teenage could, teenagers could send rude pictures to each other. They found out first that that's what teenagers wanted to do, then they built the product. So you've always kind of, techne, technology just means art, right? It means craft, right? And everyone is a tool builder. It's just, I think for a long time, that, that tool building was monopolized by industry. And you had to go to the factory because the factory was so big, just like our old computers used to be so big. But this stuff is becoming atomized now. And now everyone's a tool maker. We're, we're bringing the means of our production to work every day, even if, assuming we are going to work. Many of us don't even travel to work anymore. We work from wherever our laptops are. The laptops become the new factory. And something that you see a lot, uh, a lot of Bitcoiners saying or people involved um, in the space saying is, you know, it doesn't matter who wrote the white paper, we're all Satoshi. It, it's very much a meme, like it's an idea. It's less about who made it, and I don't want to know if there's, you know, who the people are behind it, because I, you know, you raise a good point about religions too. Anytime you can personalize something, you, there's the problem with, you know, idolizing who that is, and I, uh, so there's been a lot of speculation over who it is, and Nathan said uh, people predict that they think it's Nick Zabos, that is a linguistics expert who've done the research, 97% match for Satoshi Nakamoto. Yeah, there wasn't, yeah, familiar enough. With there that, wasn't enough, but... there wasn't enough data to go on, and also, like, the, the problem is that I've looked through Satoshi's work as well, because it's not, I'm not incurious about it, of course, yeah, if, if, if someone happened to know who he was, of course I'd want to know, that's only human, but I don't put it at the forefront of my day, I don't make this all about who, who is this person, but if you go through a lot of the posts, and you should be doing that anyway, because you should be trying to learn about where this came from, you'll notice that he or she, probably a she in my opinion, constantly switches between American English and British English, it's almost as if they're deliberately trying to mask who they are, so I, I, don't, I don't think it was Nick Saber. Personally, um, I think it would probably shock us if we did learn who it was. I did notice that while reading the, right, the white paper, and uh, you know, I, it's something that you notice if you do a lot of reading, you can pick up on certain styles, and it's very, um, it almost doesn't have a style. I mean, like it does, but it, it's very hard to pinpoint, and you can tell there was very careful considerations. You know, it was written by a person or a group of people who, had a clear understanding of, you know, people are of course going to be curious and want to find out who it is, so they obviously took great pains to, uh, you know, make, separate it from the people as much as possible, and so I, I think that's really, uh, that's really telling and that's really interesting, um, and I mean, you can even go back and like rereading and rereading it, it's just so fascinating, I, I do like uh, the style it is written in and it is a very, it's so clear and concise too. Um, it's but humble. It's, hard to it, it, it's yeah. humble in the face of ambition. Like no, he, you know, she doesn't ask for permission. She just does something. She says, "I've seen a problem. This idea it keeps coming to me. So I just went out and wrote it. What do you think?" And they're looking for feedback. No marketing. 
no pub, no PR, no pizzazz, no me too product offerings, no like, oh, I'm doing that too. I'm a, I'm a 2.0 product. So, you know, because at the time when Satoshi invented Bitcoin was the time everyone was jumping on social media. Do you remember that whole wave? It was all web 2.0 and you've got to have a business in this area. And it's all about locking in profit. It's about creating a brand. It's about having the passwords to a website and being able to get people to do things for you for free or for really, really cheap and then like selling their labor on for more than they worked for and then over time they're selling off to Google or Facebook and you get all that private and then meanwhile you know Satoshi whoever he or she is they're actually going oh this idea it keeps you know keeps bugging me but I keep up. it wasn't even new technology you know all that stuff the, 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 the hash cash the proof of work and, and the Merkle trees from Ralph Merkle in the late 90s and the public private key cryptography none of that stuff was original it was just a reimagining it was a values innovation and they just put it together and they go, oh, look what happens when you put it in this sequence like this. Look at what you get from this. And we still haven't had that ever since Bitcoin. We, we, now we've got a pump and dumps. We've got PR schemes. We've got people setting up more and more you know, websites with nice looking you know, front pages, but very little going on behind the scenes. They want your money now. Satoshi never asked for any money. At no point did they ask for any funding. They didn't say this is going to be a $13 billion industry in five years and if you give me your money now, I will write a white paper and write some dodgy code in C++. No, they wrote the code first and then they started getting feedback on it straight away. Yeah, so I, that brings me to a couple other questions. Why do you think that Satoshi is a woman and how is, how is Feathercoin different from some of these other cryptocurrencies out there? Uh, it's something... Yeah, I've looked a little bit into it, but uh, you, you did mention the pump and dump schemes, and that's obviously a problem uh, with some of these other altcoins. So how, how is Feathercoin a little bit different? Well, hang on. So the first question was, why did I think Satoshi was a woman? Yes. Um, I don't think you get that many men onto an internet forum unless it's run by a woman. Also, if you read the work in a female voice, if you audiate it like in your mind, it sounds better, it reads better, it scans better. And also, I could apply a bit of philosophical logic. I only fall in love with women. I fell in love with Satoshi, therefore Satoshi is a woman. That works perfectly, um, logically. Um, there's no flaw in that whatsoever. No, I, I mean, I read it. I was besotted as soon as I read the white paper. I was just like, oh, my fucking God, this, this is brilliant. This is such a good idea. I couldn't believe how elegant it was. I didn't eat for days. You know, I was just like, this is amazing. And this person was a surreal hero because... This is, this is exactly what I'd been trying to say to people for a long time when I was hanging out in the startup scene. And people just weren't doing it. They were too busy pandering to investors and they had their exit strategy. You've got your exit strategy, you've got to have that, you've got to get out in five years, you know. And, um, and then along comes somebody who just brings a breath of fresh air to the whole process and just thinks very, very calmly and rationally about something. Um, so that was the first question. The second question was, why is Feathercoin different? So I came across Feathercoin whilst I was on BTCE trying to talk people out of trading. <laughs> and the, this group of people came along and I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And they were from Oxford, which is near where I live. And I, what I found was just a group of people who just wanted to have some impact. And they particularly wanted to focus on the local area of Oxford rather than trying to boil the oceans, taking over the world and all the rest of it. And I saw some good stewards. I saw some people who I believed would keep turning up who would be good stewards of, of the coin, whereas all the other ones um, just seem to be anonymous people and you know the price would sort of be volatile, but then the, the, the developer would just disappear over time and, and then the, it would just turn into a zombie project. But when I kind of saw you know Peter come along and he wanted to make it more about the community, he didn't want to put any novel features in it, he wanted to see if he could get this cryptocurrency to work in their local space, I was like, yeah, this is good on. This is, this is more of that humility. And it was more about the people. And it wasn't about trying to reinvent the wheel. It was just trying to have as much impact as you could with that, um, with that technology. Now, things changed. In February, MC Gox happened. Tom was harassing me. He was telling me to come and do some shows in the World Crypto Network because we'd had some success with Andreas and, the, and some other videos that we've been doing. And I changed my mind. I realized that Bitcoin needed our help the most that uh, if Bitcoin failed, all of these projects failed. Uh, in the long run, I think it's right that we probably will have many, many blockchains, probably a blockchain, as many blogs as we have blockchains, right? 
just like um, you know, every business will probably have one for something. And when you start dealing at scale, essentially, if we start colonizing other planets, if we ever get to that kind of scale as a civilization, if we build dice and spheres and become a type one, um, we're definitely going to need more blockchains because a, a Bitcoin blockchain can only uh, transmit over 10 light minutes. Um, and after that, you get too much latency. So you're definitely going to need overlapping blockchains. I really think that where blockchains become the most powerful is in notarizing our activities and actually putting, you know, putting your, your like I've been encouraging people to do, put all your work into a Git repo and then publish the SHA-1 on the commitments periodically, say every day or something. And then that would track your work such that later on you could prove that that work exists at that time. So I spent less time with Feathercoin, I'm still part of the developer uh, Skype group and I still go on the forum and if they need me to do anything I, I absolutely will. But I also realized that you know these organizations need to exist even when the founders leave, right? So it couldn't be that Feathercoin became dependent on me or, or Peter or, or anyone there. And I found that that's exactly what happened when I started doing videos on the Gox thing because that I thought that was a credible threat to the whole industry. I mean, it was just, it was, it, was, it, it speaks to the resilience of Bitcoin, that how it keeps bouncing back, how it, how it, it keeps surviving these failures, and healthy markets do grow from failure. But I just thought that was reckless, and I thought it was cold, and I thought he is just the most unconscious human I have met and have seen in a long time. Mark Carpellis, I'm, I'm talking about, and I saw that as a real threat to the whole project, to the whole endeavor. And, and I see that a little bit now, not as much right now with the, with the price dropping and all these margin traders and they're just wasting their lives away. They're just, they're just whittling away their time on these trading platforms, borrowing so money. So that's something I've been thinking a lot on lately is there's a lot of concern of you know what the regulators are going to do and these people who are kind of like these external threats to Bitcoin and really I think there's more of a threat from Bitcoin coming from the inside in some ways Correct. Uh, you know that that's what I've been focusing on lately you know where you know who are these big players coming into Bitcoin you know where where, where are they moving around their money and you know putting pressure on people stuff like that that really fascinates me because it's very easy to trust someone who identifies the same as you. Go, going back to the identity thing, you know, people are more likely to trust others who use the same kinds of labels as them. And what happens is that blinds people to very clear signs of deception in a lot of ways. It's very easy, and I found myself, uh, you know, falling into this trap too. You know, oh, well, you're, you know, you're a this, I'm at this, you know, we're going to get along because we kind of believe in the same kinds of things, or at least we claim to, and obviously that doesn't work. Uh, that it doesn't work for any other label, and it doesn't work with the label of a Bitcoiner. So yeah, there are a lot of Bitcoin enthusiasts out there uh, who are, you know, really, you know, maybe they're evangelizing a lot, maybe they are doing outreach, or maybe they have a lot of money too, and a lot of people are looking to them to get funding for their projects, but are these the people that have the same vision as everyone else or as, as some of the other others involved. You kind of have to question it and it's something that's worth studying. I, I think uh, you know we self-policing is sometimes difficult to do but it doesn't have to be in the form of stopping people necessarily. Self-policing can be just being aware of you know who's around you, who's who's involved in the space, who, who are some of these people that are moving their money around and you know maybe applying pressure in certain areas or investing in certain things. So uh, I, I, I'm just trying to kind of keep an eye on that at the moment too. I think there's a lot of internal threats that are being overlooked. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely bang on. The biggest threats do not come from regulators and governments. They come from inside of the, the Bitcoin sphere itself. It comes from the, the centralization of development. We have a new feature, if you don't mind me plugging, on the Chris Before Coffee show called Developer Watch. Um, you have to imagine the graphics and the reverb because we don't have that technology yet. Um, and we're going to be scrutinizing the Bitcoin developer mailing list on SourceForge and we're going to be going through some of these decisions because what you're talking about at the moment, okay, is an industry that is populated with no more than a thousand people that really know how to set up a cryptocurrency or how to maintain one, right? Peter Bushnell is one of those thousand I would, I would categorize him in. And I think what I realized around February time was that there was the, 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 a culture did not exist, or rather one did exist, but it wasn't a desirous one, 
right? And that was the culture of speculation that you had, where your instant reaction was to go off and create your own coin. Now, in the case of Peter, I think it was a very sound judgment on his part. He was responding to the, as he saw it in Litecoin, the lack of community focus where it was just basically trying to get the price to go up. That's the only real reason why you're on the form. You weren't doing it for any ideological reasons. And he wanted to create an atmosphere that was more convivial and like, okay, let's get the local pub to, to do it. And look, what's the downside, right? Because they can still take Bitcoin as well. And, and whenever it, Peter would go out, he wouldn't just tell them about Feathercoin. He would tell them about Bitcoin too. And he would try to get them more involved. But there are advantages to having more than one blockchain, not least because the fees are a lot lower. And the commitment that Feathercoin made to always changing the hashing algorithm so you were never incentivized to build ASIC miners so that you could always keep the, the hobbyists uh, in the game because you don't just want hashing rate that's made by profit-seeking mercenaries. So it's like you wouldn't want to go to war with nothing but mercenaries. And mercenaries are not going to put themselves into harm's way. Um, so that, that's what we have with Feathercoin, but I think you're right. It, it's not the regulators we need to be worried about. We can just ignore them. If, if everyone just stops paying tax simultaneously, what the fuck are they going to do? They're going to come around to everybody's house? No, what they'll probably do is they'll try to set an example. But look at what's happening in Ferguson at the moment. It's not working very well, is it, when they try to make examples out of people? Because there are going to be other people there with cameras, which are way more powerful than guns. Right? When they say, don't shoot... It's usually because they don't want you to photograph them now. It's not because they want you to shoot them, right? And so now we can record them and we can put it on social media and the court of public opinion will have its say. And what you find is these people fade away into the background and they all need to get elected. Look at the British government, right? George Osborne taking Bitcoins out of the ATM. Why? Because there's an election in nine months and he knows that Bitcoin is popular and it's capturing a bit of a wave. He wants to get elected. That's where they're weak. But you've just got to ignore them out of existence and just set up better systems, set up better competing systems, talk about it, publicize it, let other people see what you're doing. That was why they shut down Silk Road. It was an embarrassment for the government because he was doing something the government should have done a long time ago. He removed the violence from the drug trade. Oh, I'm sorry, did your military contracts rely on the drug war continuing? Oh, I'm sorry, is that a little bit inconvenient for you that some hacker just set up a website and removed violence from the drug trade? Like, this is ridiculous. They're just embarrassed because he ended up doing the job that they should have been doing all along. Right. But, of course, you know, it's more profitable for them to ramp up the violence and continue their, you know, drug trading, too. So, uh, so this is where I'm going to cover a couple more questions. Uh, so I think this is kind of going back to... This is from Nathan. Uh, look at the file sharing program, eDonkey Creators and Bitcoin. Some believe it's also, I guess this is a, uh, mm. who Satoshi might be, Jed McCaleb, founder of Mt. Gox, creator of Ripple, lots of speculation. No, yes. Um, After I saw the way he behaved in dumping the coins, that's that's not something Satoshi would have done. Yeah, and this is this is good. I, I, I think it would be good to kind of elaborate on this too. What is inside? Perhaps it's an infiltration, divide uh, at Impera, divide and conquer. Mm. Um, so I, I, I don't know if um, maybe it's so much of a divide and conquer thing. I, th I think you kind of see a little bit of friction between the people who are pro, let's work with the regulators, and anti-work with the regulators. But I, I think it's deeper than that. Like there, there are people who are just in this because they think they can make a quick buck. And that's really the more people that, that I'm talking about uh, when I say these kind of inside people who are coming into this space. Maybe they have a lot of money. Maybe they're trying to push their money around. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know. There might be – I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some disinformation being spread and stuff like that. But, I, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even be surprised if there are probably a lot of government agents that are trying to, you know – uh, infiltrate or agitate or whatever, but I, I don't know. I, I think the threat is a little bit different from that. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that when you sign up to Bitstamp or when you sign up to Coinbase, you are putting more personal identifiable information into a database that you don't control. 
when you interact on the blockchain, that is a database that everyone controls. That's on your hard drive, it's on everyone else's, and everyone knows the rules up front. There's no fear of like, well, who's going to buy out that company? Who's going to have access to that data? You're interacting with a server, with a computer, like the one right in front of you right now that you're watching this video on, except you don't have the password to it. And they can take backups of that data. And when you think it's deleted, it's not really deleted. It's been backed up. And so people are doing all this trading and they're thinking, oh, I'm private, I'm private, it's in secret, I've got the password. No, 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 you share the password with about five or six other people who have an eye on their exit, their five-year exit strategy where they're going to sell for millions of dollars and go on, you know, suck pina coladas on the beach whilst World War Three breaks out. Remember that one from earlier on. And, um, and you're just being played. What do you think is going to happen when all these... Um, all these people pandering to regulators start getting the regulation they've always wanted. What's going to happen to these databases? You're going to start going to get letters from the IRS, from HMRC saying, oh, we see that you've been trading in Bitcoin. Why were you using dark markets? Why were you using that platform out in Bulgaria? Why were you doing this? And it's not necessarily that they have the database from that platform in Bulgaria, but they have the database from Slovakia or somewhere else. And that points to the database that is in these darker regions. So it's just a basic total totalitarian regime, these people just aren't thinking big enough. Their ideas aren't ambitious enough. They don't know how to think creatively. They're just trying to create the old system again. They've seen that this is going to change and they've identified Bitcoin as being powerful. And what they do is they try to integrate it into the current paradigm rather than trying to imagine a better one. And that's the problem. Absolutely, and that's something I always keep an eye on too. Is these exchanges that are popping up, you know, specifically Coinbase. Who, I mean, they collect a lot of your personal information. And the thing is, it, for the sake of convenience, people are just kind of giving this information up, and they think, oh, well, I can trust these Bitcoin exchanges. No, these Bitcoin exchanges are already preparing for the regulations to come. They're already making databases of your information and getting mm -hmm. it all ready so that they can be compliant when the when the hammer comes down. I mean, these people, you know, they're, they're not your friends on the exchanges. I mean, you know... Uh, None it's, of these startups are your start friend. None of these startups are your friend. When you start a tech startup, you turn every friend into an enemy. They are, your, they are there to be mined. Facebook is, and Google are mining companies. They mine your attention, they mine your mind, you're, you're plugged into a machine, they define what's next. They tell you what's urgent right now. What's urgent right now, rather than that work I should be doing, is going on Facebook and playing more Farmville or whatever the fuck it is that you're doing. And they get you on the crack lolly, but they're there to collect your personal identifiable information. That's because you have a unique perspective on the world and every single action you take further proves your existence, makes you more individuated than you were before because you're adding more experience and you're stretching yourself out and they want that and they want to monetize it. So yeah, when you start a startup, it's all about pandering to investors and what do the investors want? Five times their return in three years and how do they get that? By collecting as much personal identifiable information about your peers as possible. So what have you got to do? You've got to put a nice shiny wrapper on that database. You've got to make it look really good. Hire a UX guy. Hire a social media marketer marketing guru, right, SEO guru, you've got to get the traction, you've got to get the hits, got to get the eyeballs on the screen, get them onto your website, okay, get them handing over that information, get them taking pictures, that's even better because then you can prove that they were there at the time, get the GPS coordinates, get everything and then sell it out. Don't care, don't worry about who you sell it out to, don't try to worry too much about what their ethics are, just sell it to whoever pays the most and it's, and, and yeah, you, you, you're, it's just a very, very, it's the opposite of philia. It's the opposite of friendship. You're turning everyone into an enemy. Everyone is either a customer or not a customer. And you've got to turn all the non-customers into customers. That's the aim of the game. It's like a game of zombies, like Pac-Man. Everyone is there to be consumed and brought into this state space. And for the first time, we had somebody rational, clear-headed, perhaps a god, I don't know who Satoshi is, but they came down and said, here's a better way of doing it. Here's a database everyone controls. Here's a database everyone can believe in. It's got a principle called the single history principle, which is you can't spend money unless it agrees with the history, right? I mean, you don't have all these conflicting ideas and intentions and people acting as if that money's there when it's not really there because you just typed it into a spreadsheet. And yeah, I think that was very beautiful. I still don't think people understand that though. I still don't think they even know what a blockchain is. Yeah, I mean, these companies are experimenting on you. 
basically. Uh, they're running these experiments, and Facebook is notorious for this. They, they finally, you know, got busted, and there, there were some news articles that came out about the different experiments they were doing to people. And I kind of view a lot of these exchanges much the same way, only they're con collecting your financial information, which is way, way more uh, dangerous than just, you know, logging how many hours you've been on Farmville. Uh, you know, they're still using, Facebook is still using that data to sell you stuff uh, and to advertise to you. I mean, they're selling your stuff to advertisers, stuff like that. But uh, but these exchanges, you're, you're giving up a lot of very private personal information. And what's so strange is the whole point of Bitcoin is, you know, it's based on this kind of trustless system uh, that is a better solution to what we have in the form of banks and the legacy banking system, but people still want to maintain the kind of old way of doing things. I very much view the exchanges as being part of that in that, you know, they're still trying to operate within the parameters of the same system. You're still trusting them with your money, which uh, you really shouldn't do, and uh, you're trusting that they're not going to be corrupt. And, I mean, that's just not, that's not good enough. That's, that's missing the whole point, I think, of this technology. So you're muted. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, you're right. Which is that everyone is in charge now, and everyone needs to be a leader, and we need to stop outsourcing. The only reason Mark Zuckerberg has got away from it for it this long is because he's really, really good at lying to himself. But there are times in interviews in the past, and there was a particular interview where he was challenged. I think it was back in 2010 with the Beacon product, um, where he got very flustered in the interview, and you could see that he was having a lot of internal battles, where he had lied to himself in order that he could continue to lie to the public and he couldn't keep it up any longer. This is what happened to me in my undercover videos is that I broke through, I pierced through that egotistical veil that they have to project and then the truth comes out and then their real intentions start to come through and it's all about control. It is, and uh, Zuckerberg's even been quoted as saying things like, I don't know why the hell all these idiots are giving me their information. I mean, yeah. like uh, referring to Facebook users as, you know, I, I don't think idiots was They're animals used, to him. He's in a zoo. Animals. He's in a zoo and he's on a little pet project. This is a little pet project in Harvard for him. He's never left that mentality. This was always just looking at all of these interesting animals. Look at what they do. And, and it was all about, like, who you were shagging. Do you remember Facebook official? This was a whole neologism, and it was, you know, he was publishing the IP address so you could work out who was sleeping in whose dorm room, and it just became a gossip engine. He was really pandering to the lowest common denominator. He was really going for the gutter. He was going, he was doing what the gutter press have always done. He gave them what they want, and when you get too much of what you want, it gives you cancer, and you end up with a tumor called Facebook. There you go. And Nathan has another good question. I'm going to combine his, his clarification on this. End users consent to it. FinCEN, FinTrack, and other regulatory rules exist. If exchangers want to do business, they have to follow these rules. What do you suggest? So what would be um, so it? It says, and you, and you consent to it. Did he have anything else? Let me re-emphasize the end users consent to this. So yeah, he said, let, let me re-emphasize the end users consent to this. Con consent to this. No, it's an omission. They don't, they don't consent, they just don't not consent, which is the same thing. You're not wrong. It's, um, we're, we're just having a little wordplay, aren't we? Um, no, you're not wrong, but they, like I said earlier, they need to be woken up. The regulation in Bitcoin exists in its code and its community. It exists on the forums. It exists on GitHub. It exists on the developer meetup groups. That's why we're doing Developer Watch, so that we can actually go through the mailing list, of which probably only a handful of people even bloody read. I don't know how many subscribers. There are probably many hundred, I hope. But I don't reckon a lot of people even read that mailing list because I've been following it now for a few months and I only see a handful of people engaging on that thing. And these are really important decisions that are being made. It may not look that way to other people, but you know, I've been going through it. I used to code when I was a kid and I can, I can you know, Google my way um, through it. Um, and I'm going to go on there and I'm going to start shining a light on it. So actually, this is where it's at. You know, this code is unlike human laws. Human laws are defined by the fact that they're breakable. You don't even know the laws there until it's broken. It's a post hoc event. It only takes place after the crime is being committed. Code is different. Code intervenes straight away. You don't have an opportunity to break it. You can't go on to Facebook and claim that you're not male or female. You're only allowed to be one or the other. Right? They legislate for that. Right? They tell you that this is how the world is. I've baked my values into the system. The problem with the regulators is that it's too late, it's too little, 
And anyway, all they want is a monopoly on evidence control. They want the evidence in their walls where they can see it so they can tell a story about how the crime took place. Let's have all the evidence out in the open. Let's make it pseudonymous, like Satoshi said, and let everyone be a police officer now. And you consent the same way you consent or agree to these ridiculous terms and agreements when mm -hmm. you have to check a box to sign a contract. Yeah. I mean, it's really not, you're not on level playing field here. Uh, you know, you're, you're not on equal footing at There's all. There's no meeting of minds. In law, there has to be a meeting of minds in order for the contract to be binding. But for whatever reason, no court has ever found in favor that these contracts of adhesion are real. And maybe it's hashtag apathy, right? This is uh, Juice Rap Media. I love this line. Hashtag apathy. People just don't care. They just selfie, and then you know, and they, and they're not thinking long term. I don't know. I was I was going to talk. We've been going for two hours. I was going to talk a bit, and maybe we can leave this for another time. I don't know whether you've got other things to do. I'm happy to go on all night, by the way. Oh but no, I, I was going to yeah, talk about here, like. So. This, I was like, there's something that feels like a split. It feels like the humanity's gone off, is going off in two very different directions. Maybe even more. You had these kind of high order thinkers. You know, your Einsteins, your Niels Bohr. You know, your maybe your Heideggers to some extent, and your philosophers, your Wittgensteins. And then you had your Hitlers and your Pol Pots and your Stalins, the animalists. Like the, these people were just raw nature and, and, and nothing else. Like, oh, fuck it, philosophy. You know, fuck it, we're all greedy. Oh, fuck it. You know, it's all shit, isn't it? And oh, fuck it, people will just kill each other. And then they just give up. Whereas then you had Einstein, who solves a problem, and that's not enough. He keeps thinking about it. And then he finds he solves another problem. And then he solves another problem. And he keeps going. And they, they, they just have this unending, open-ended curiosity towards the world. They don't cling on to being right all the time. It's not about them. It's not about their ego. It's about learning. It's about understanding that everything you describe is yourself plus the world. But then you return to the world again. The world plus your work equals the whole world. You, you extend things. You bring things into existence. It's about never settling. And I think that's what we've seen. We've seen this curious-minded sort of technorati class emerge, like your Gavin Andreessen's and, and so on, your Peter Todd's, right? And they're getting together and they're now organizing in a much more efficient way, much the same way that Homo sapiens sapien did, right, when the Neanderthalus was dying out. And you had this group of humans you know, even if you go to Papua New Guinea today, there's a really good documentary by Jared Diamond called Guns, Germs and Steel. It's a very famous movie, controversial book, but he nevertheless tells the story in Papua New Guinea where he says, these people are advanced. They can go barehanded into the jungle and within a couple of hours they can set up makeshift shelters, traps for animals, they can do all this stuff. He's like, a modern day Western person wouldn't survive an hour in the jungle. They'd be dead already, right? But these people in Papua New Guinea are in touch with the world around. What we've done is we've kind of elevated ourselves with this concrete. We concrete over nature. This is a war with nature fundamentally. It's a war with ourselves because we are nature, humus of the earth, no? And then, and then we just separate everything. And it's not as if America isn't, let's face it, probably the most advanced civilization that's ever existed in its short history. It probably is. It's more advanced than the ancient Egyptians. It's probably more advanced than than ancient Greece, despite all of its, you know, inventions of science and so on. But I don't I don't know where it's going. But I think I think this technorati class are going to win long term. And at the moment they're being controlled by money because the big money tells them what's so most of these developers are working in big in banks and, and corporations. But you're seeing more and more of them now move into these open source because there's something that we're missing. Like when you're getting paid it's not really free. You're still sacrificing a bit of yourself that you'll never get back, that that money can't really compensate for you. And I think as the existing system starts to unravel and a lot of its internal inconsistencies start to become more apparent to people and they start to realize what you mean, you can't have an ever-increasing money supply? You mean this thing is just a con, that it was never really real, that we've been living in a hologram, that a, a house isn't really something that costs you 25, 30 years of labor, but perhaps probably only costs you the best of like a year or two's worth of labor? And they start to see the whole thing unravel, and then they go, wow, how did I ever believe that? It's an Armageddon in the sense that it's a reawakening. 
we start to reevaluate things that we've seen before. And I think it will be these engineers that will be at the forefront of that, these open-ended, curi curious thinkers who negotiate peacefully online when they have disagreements rather than lobbing projectiles at each other. And it will be interesting to see the direction things kind of take. I think people are becoming less trustful of exchanges in general, and this is why we need to get Bitcoin spread to as many people as possible so we can have peer-to-peer -peer transactions instead of going through these these exchanges that are very, very similar to the legacy banking system, and they're collecting just as much information on you. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the it's kind of interesting because... I'm sure the exchanges want wide, widespread adoption as much as anyone else because they see dollar signs, you know, they see the ability to accumulate capital over it, but at the same time that widespread uh, adoption could be a kind of, uh, it could be an attack on the exchanges in a lot of ways because then it turns out, oh, well, you, you don't really need these exchanges anymore, now do we? So uh, well, it is kind there's of... There's a bouncy, there's, it's a bouncy, isn't it? Right, as soon as your database gets valuable enough, it's more profitable to hack into it than it is to kind of leave it there, right? This mm -hmm. is the problem. You can't hack Bitcoin. When was the last time someone tried to hack Bitcoin? Doesn't happen. Yeah, there have been DDoS attacks and there have been script kiddies that have tried to be pests on the blockchain, but that's all they are. They're just pests. No, all of the attack vectors were at the centralized institutions. The falling of Mount MT Gox, sorry, I keep saying Mount Gox, MT Gox, was a, it was a reassurance, thank fuck they went after the centralized exchange and not the decentralized one, right? Why did they do that? Because that's the weakest link. They didn't go after the blockchain and that should have been reassuring. What the media should have said is, oh, look at how they went after that centralized database. Perhaps we should learn our lesson now. Perhaps we shouldn't give a few people the keys to a ledger. Maybe that ledger is made of the same particles that the rest of the world is made of, and it's just as fragile as everything else. No. What you own is what you control. It's what's in your custody. The land that you, I think, morally own is the land that you can maintain and look after, because that is the land that's right in front of you, not the land that you've got written down on a bit of paper at a distance that entirely relies on a law enforcement network, which is paid for by the taxpayer, which, again, is an unsustainable finance model. Anyway, rant over. <laughs> I totally agree, and eventually the, the conflict of privacy and security and convenience, all of these things, is really going to be coming to a head in the Bitcoin space. I mean, it already is an issue, I think. It's a huge issue that I think... I, I think it's on a lot of people's, you know, priority lists of things, you know, big issues, but for people who are just coming into it, it's not as emphasized as much, and I think when you're getting someone on board with Bitcoin, I think, uh, you know, it's important to emphasize the aspects of it, the decentralized aspects of it. You know, don't just send them to Coinbase because they can hook it up to their bank account and that's easy and mm -hmm. they can buy Bitcoin that way. You know, to talk to them a little bit about the philosophy of it, a little bit about, you know, what it really means, you know, because it's so much more, and, you know, obviously it's, it's easy to, you know, if you're us, you know, we could just talk for hours about it and really mm -hmm. get caught up in the potentials and things like that. But you can do it in a down-to-earth way, too. And especially if someone's already kind of ha has the mindset, yeah, they're kind of a little bit awake. They realize the problems that, you know, going on in the world. I mean, the problems are pretty obvious, but, you know, they're also well covered up in certain areas, too. So, uh, you know, if it, I found it works best if you're talking with someone who's already whose eyes are already open to some of these things that are going on, and they tend to take more uh, to that kind of philosophical discussion too. Um, uh, so this is this is a cool comment from Dustin. He uh, says, "Talk about Patreon and why we need." To, and why they need to take Bitcoin, or how you prefer donations. Mr. Chris Ellis equals Socrates. Coinbase is automated, but it doesn't have a community for a show or a network to cover the news. Hashtag ancient Athens. Yeah, I actually think we should... Uh, I love the fact that he identifies Athens, because, of course, it wasn't all of uh, ancient uh, Greece. We should also probably stop calling it Greece, because Greece was a made-up word by the Romans that they used to try and change history. Of course, we know that now because of the invention of archaeology and anthropology and history, right? The, the Romans thought they could fork the blockchain, and they thought that they could repurpose a lot of the gods that the, that the Hellenic people had come up with, and uh, they called them Greek. It was just a made-up word. There's no etymology for it. Um, and 
yeah, I think yeah, we need more Socratic dialogue. We need more the 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 why the 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 what is it question. But what what is it? What does justice mean? Like, what do you mean? So that we're not talking at cross purposes all the time, so we can get an understanding of it. And we need to be the gadfly in the marketplace. Why did Socrates go to the marketplace? Why did Nietzsche declare God was dead in the marketplace? What does God have to do with the market, right? And where do our desires come from? And questions like this: Why do we set up these systems that are all geared towards the satisfaction of desires? What's going on behind this three-dimensional projection that I'm looking at? What's going on back here in all of the things that determine my actions, my desires? Where do they come from? Start asking that, and maybe you don't need that bottle of wine with the meal tomorrow night. And maybe you don't need to you know, have that gym membership, which you never use anyway. And maybe you don't need all those cable TVs. And maybe you can cut a lot of this crud out of your life. And then you'll realize that you're not so vulnerable when the government declares a bunch of spending cuts because you've got tons more surplus capital because you weren't busy wasting on stuff you never really needed in the first place. So yeah, being being self-sustainable, yeah, going out and, and, and being annoying to people. But you can be endearing, like you don't have to piss people off. Socrates didn't piss a lot of people off. He did a few people, but they deserved it, right? Um, most of the people found him endearing and, and they kind of thought he was sort of Interesting. I mean, we don't have any writings from him, of course. We've only got secondhand stuff. But yeah, I do think we need Socrates again. I certainly wouldn't compare myself to him. But I think everyone, let's say this, everyone is Socrates now. Everyone needs to go out and act like this because that's our responsibility. As a civilization, we've got more history than any civilization has ever had. We can see inside of the ancient Egyptians. We can see inside of the Sumerians. We can see inside of the Aztecs. They couldn't see us, but we can see them. And we ended up becoming the gods they prayed to. We ended up being the magicians that could fly and could do all of these things, right? All of these things that they said gods were so good at. We ended up becoming those. And so we, we now have this responsibility where it's like, well, we've seen the way this goes before. When a civilization gets comfortable, and it starts to rest on its laurels and it, it confuses comfort with safety. We've seen what happens when the wealth gets concentrated into the few, like it did you know, with the, Mycene with the Mycenaeans before, before Greece emerged. And we don't have to make that same mistake again. We can be more conscious and we can actually respond in a more productive way and we can actually identify, and I still haven't answered it yet, but something like, you know, what does it mean to be human? What are we anyway? What, what, what is the human project? What are we here for? No one's asking those questions. Everyone just goes off and they take their lattes and they go to work and they put in eight hours and they don't question anything, you know. But yeah, Patreon is cool. Um, are you using it yet, Megan? I'm not using it yet, but you uh, need I need to, to look more it. into. Yeah. You, need to, you need to get on it. I'm on it. I'm not really plugging it too much. Like, I'm just happy for people to turn up. I've got two Patreons, you know. And I'm like, I'm cool with that. Like, if people want to turn up and they want to donate, that's cool. If not, that's okay too. Um, I'm, I'm not you know, really, really plugging it. But I like the model, and they definitely do need to get into Bitcoin. They said they were going to, and they haven't yet. Um, but I like the idea that you pay for something because you enjoy it. And it's just like, here, have my money. I want this to exist. I want this to continue. And you've got a three and a half billion strong addressable market. And if they, if like a fraction of them paid you 25 cents a month, that would easily be enough to pay your rent. So it's in your own interest, you at home, to not just sit here and watch us talk, but for you to get your own YouTube channel, for you to get your own blog, and for you to solicit funds. Because if we all do this together, and we all create this shift in culture, it benefits everyone. Because it's a new way of financing. It's a new way of rewarding each other for our sacrifices. So start now. Agreed. And being a gadfly works. You know, it, it's very easy to kind of get overwhelmed with all of the bad news and even kind of, uh, you know, freak out to the point where you're, where you're, you know, trying to overshare it too much. But if you can find that kind of nice balance with it to where you're informing people and they're, you know, they're, they're actively coming to you and things like that. I've seen a lot of people that I thought would, would never come around to certain ideas completely do 180s. I mean, life life is very long. We, we have a lot of years on this earth, hopefully, and there's so much time to learn and to accumulate knowledge. And really, I, I view knowledge, it's something that's always under attack, too. So 
you know, as much as much work you can put into it, uh, and kind of you know all the activism that you put into it is all worthwhile because knowledge is under attack. And it's interesting you mentioned Athens. This reminds me of this uh, story. I was it was back in it was probably back in high school. I think I was like a sophomore in high school or something like that. And we were learning about Athens and Sparta. And the teacher divided us into groups, and the groups had to pick a spokesperson for Athens. It was like Athens versus Sparta, right? So it was this kind of humorous thing, and they would send up the person to you know, talk about why one was better than the other. It was kind of like a competition. So I ended up being, we, I ended up being in the Sparta group which uh, they wanted me to be the spokesperson for the Spartans. And so the, the Athenian spokesperson kind of gets up there and kind of gives some of these, you know, arguments for, oh, you know, civilized society and philosophy, some of, you know, some of these things. And, um, but the thing is, so, you know, versus is such a weird thing, but it was, you know, to kind of, you know, illustrate some historical points. So I went up there and I, I basically bullshitted but I very passionately bullshitted why Sparta was so much better than Athens, just like, just humorously, you know. But like, I got really riled up about it, you know. I used to be in theater and stuff like that, so like, I was just getting like riled. Up. I was like, yeah, those those sissy Athenians, like blah blah blah. blah. The people ate it up, and it, you know, the Spartans ended up winning, you know, whatever, uh, you know, in the contest well, because they, of that. They, they, well, that's, they but, didn't but, in the long run. But they didn't in the long run, and see, that was the point. It, it wasn't necessarily to say who won, you know, historically, because the thing is, you know, knowledge wins historically, but at the same time, mm -hmm. it's always under attack. And the thing is, I, the way I kind of viewed it, too, I remember thinking of it this way at the time, also, kind of looking around, it's like, it reflects kind of how, uh, you know, the greater society can be, too. You know, you have someone who's very loudly proclaiming things, and because they're very loud, people think they're very right. But that's not mm -hmm. always correct. Mm -hmm. You have to examine the things. And if you're not adequately defending knowledge, that's as bad as, you know, uh, pe people attacking it. If you can't, you know, adequately defend something, then you're going to lose a lot of people. But it is worth it in the long run to, you know, to try to take a balanced approach to things and, and talk to people because these things matter. And, you know, you care about your friends and loved ones and, you know, you want them to you know, have a good understanding of the world, and you can't make people want knowledge, though, is the thing. You kind of have to meet them where they're at. So, yeah, how do you make... Plato, Plato had an idea. He, he called it bronze soul people, silver soul people, and gold soul people, and unfortunately, that's not very palatable. It, it's, it's painful to think that people can be put into categories of superiority, and we've seen this, you know, with Zionism, we've seen it with Nazism, that as soon as you start calling yourself or a group of people as superior, it doesn't end well. Um, and actually what's interesting, and maybe we can end with a final thought, something along the lines of, you know, ancient Greece started with a thinker and a warrior, and it started with, you know, two myths and a mythos that, that originally got its source from a logos. Logos language means, it has the same etymology as leg, it means to, to gather. And although the, the, in ancient Greece they didn't have any history, they had Herodotus who invented history, but they didn't, they didn't know what came before them. They didn't know who their ancestors were. And I suppose my point is that we do. Um, and we have a different form of storytelling, thanks to the Greeks. It's called science. It's about forming hypotheses and then attempting to prove or disprove those hypotheses so that they can be reconstructed anywhere in the universe. And that's what Bitcoin is. It's a way of telling a story that the whole world can agree on. That will work anywhere where the rules of physics work, anywhere that the maths works, which is pretty much anywhere in our known universe right now. And hand waving and loud noises only are effective for so long. You're never going to brute force two plus two into equaling something different. And I'm not talking to you like math whizzes who are into the imaginary numbers and stuff. You know what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, you're never going to force something that isn't true to be true just by increasing your volume. So truth does win out in the long term. You just have to be persistent and you have to adequately defend it too. Um, so I, I really like, I just wanted to make this little comment from Chad. Uh, he, he may have left by now, but he says, thanks guys for a great program. I think in the long run, Bitcoin will change the financial world for the better. All we need now is new revolutionary energy technology. Thanks again. So thank you, Chad, for, for participating. And I, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I would like you. to see some revolutionary energy technology. Heck yeah. So how, how do we, uh, 
how can we yeah, how can we do that? Like <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so. <you> tune in <laughs> for our next episode. Next <laughs> the episode. Sphere. You the two solar hours panel together. around the around the sun, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Oh, this has been wonderful. So yeah. thanks again so much for joining me. I mean, really, I, I this could be its own show, I think, just like doing discussions, you know, every now and then, just, you know, I, I really enjoyed it last time, and this time was just great. I expected it to be longer, too. I was like, everyone, I'm, I'm interviewing Chris. It's going to be really long. It's going to be really awesome, though. So I, I love the longer interviews. And yeah, me too. you got to get into the details. You know, you can't always hash out the details. And I yeah, and also people can leave time stamps below in the links. And if you just put, like, 45 colon 00, that will automatically turn it into a link to that part of the video. So it's not even as if people have to watch the whole videos now. I regularly put show notes below and links to parts where we talked about different topics. So yeah, you've got to you've got to have those deep meandering chats. It's been an absolute privilege to be here. Um, more than happy, obviously, to do it again and again and again. Awesome. And where can people keep up with your work? At Mr. Chris Ellis is where I hang out on Twitter most of the time these days. Um, I do have chrisellis.me, but I don't update it as much as I should. So probably Twitter is the best. All right. Thanks again, Mr. Chris Ellis. It was a pleasure as always. And I'll stay tuned for next week. Michael Goldstein is going to be joining me. He is a president of the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute. It's going to be a pretty interesting discussion. Uh, so stay tuned. And uh, until next time, keep calm and encrypt on.